Great. We have like a whole kit and caboodle of spectrum guys here, I see, in my big screen. <laughs> um, we ready to go? Andy, you're... We're, we're live and ready to roll. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to this um, last meeting of the school year for the Operations Policy and Planning meeting, uh, Monday, June the 13th. And the Greater Victoria School District wishes to recognize and acknowledge the Esquimalt and Songhees nations on whose traditional territories we live, we learn, and we do our work. It's been very lovely today to see the sunshine. I hope everybody got a little bit of vitamin D out there because uh, we haven't had a lot of it. And our plants and gardens and everything needs, needs all of that as well as us. So again, thank you for giving up your evening and joining us. Uh, could I have approval of the agenda for this evening? And I don't have everybody on a screen here, so it's gonna take me a while to scroll through. Thank you, Jordan and Ryan. Thank you. Approval of the agenda. Um, Trustee Duncan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just have a couple of additions to the agenda I'd like to move. The first okay. one would be to add a presentation at B5. Uh, from Jesse Brown from Mason Farms. So we have been in communication with Mr. Brown and uh, he has a slot on the uh, board meeting at the end of the month. I wonder if I could move an amendment to the agenda. Um, Mr. Brown is actually prepared to present tonight and the matter is um, quite time sensitive. Um, and there is a related motion that I would also like to add to the agenda under new business, so which is the next amendment. Okay, so um, and they're they are related. So why they don't are. you give us why don't you give us your notice of motion and then we'll see if uh, we want to deal with them this evening. New business. So the, yeah, so it's the motion I emailed um, uh, folks today about. Uh, so it would be under new uh, new business H one. Uh, that the Board of Education of School District Number 61, Greater Victoria, direct the superintendent to schedule the planned storm drain installation at Vic High for a period after mid-September 2022 to allow the Vic High learning farm growing season, including planting and harvesting, to conclude without interruption. Okay. So those are the, the two amendments, and I think we'll deal with uh, B5 first. So uh, um, we have a motion to amend the agenda. Uh, any discussion for that? Uh, Trustee Painter, we're talking about B5, about the presentation first. Sure, I don't have a huge concern with with having having a presentation um my and i know you wanted to talk about the presentation first so if we're just going to talk about that um i mean i would prefer everything to come at once so i i kind of have to talk about both of them uh That's chair fine. so if you'll if you'll allow me yeah. um i i received the email uh motion from trustee duncan at 9 12 this morning it's been a very busy work day for me, I don't have nearly enough information on what's being proposed here. I have not heard anything from staff. I don't know if staff are ready to present their information for us this evening. There's quite a few questions that I have, so I don't know if it makes sense. I mean, I, again, to have um, the presenter present tonight, maybe that, maybe that will work, or maybe we just do it for the board meeting at the end of the month um, or on the 20th, which is just next week. So, uh, I mean, waiting a week, I don't know what, what the harm is there. Perhaps there is, perhaps there isn't. Again, I, I don't know. So I, I'm, I'm having a very difficult time uh, voting on whether to allow a motion to move forward with a presentation when there's a whole lot of information that I do not have. So at this point, I would be much more comfortable with having everything come at once, as well as having staff be able to provide some information around around what's happening that's just my perspective um as a one around the table okay thank you uh, uh jordan and then trustee whitaker hi thank you chair um i'd be happy to hear the presentation tonight but i agree um that it doesn't make sense to have the motion tonight 
and I understand the time sensitivity, but nothing's going to be official until June 20th because anything passed by a standing committee needs to go to the full board meeting and be voted on there before it is alive. So to me, I'd be happy to hear the presentation tonight or on Monday, um, but I think given the, the nature of the motion, we need to have um, time for you know, staff to be able to provide some context, answer our questions so that we can make a really good decision, um, which I assume would happen on Monday. Um, it's unless we're calling a special meeting, it's not happening any sooner than that either either way. So for me, the the time sensitivity argument doesn't really hold water because either way, we're going to the 20th for a decision. So um, I think either way, Either way is good. I look forward to the, the discussion, especially once we have all the information. Thanks, uh, Trustee Whitaker. Thank you and uh, thank you to Ryan and Jordan for their comments. Um, and I don't disagree. We don't have all the information. And if I'm not mistaken, that's probably why Trustee Duncan has put this here because it is only at our committee meetings that we can have that real fulsome discussion uh, and that we can include the public. And if uh, Mr. Brown is available to be here at this meeting so that the questions that do come up from the presentation, I'm not really sure that I am aware of all of the information either, um, but I might have questions for Mr. Brown. So I would like to, I, as uh, Jordan said, of course, nothing is official until the board, but I do think that there is that opportunity um, and maybe that is the time sensitivity that this would be the committee meeting to have, you know, some back and forth dialogue to, to gain that understanding, which we could not have at the board meeting. So for me, I'm happy to see the presentation and I'm really hopeful that there can be discussion around it if I do have questions. Okay. So thank you. So I'm not sure why I have such a, a big, big spread out of people on my meeting screen. I've never had this before. So it takes me a while to scroll through to find out where you're going to vote. So I'm just giving you a fair warning. Um, so um, we have, this is um, approval of the agenda and additions to the agenda. So I'm going to call the question because we're going to do both of them at the same time. It would be the presentation and the motion. We're going to call the Pardon me, Chair, sorry to interrupt yep. you, but just a point of um, order. Um, if we're going to vote on both um, at, at once, I'd like to close, please. Well, it's just an addition to the agenda. We don't need a, a great long speech. So do you want me to separate them, Trustee Duncan? Well, um, I suppose, yes, that would be another alternative is to separate them, but um, sure, I, separating them, um, but I do expect um, to, to close. Um, well, we, you can close on your motion. We, we won't close on the presentation. Uh, B5, we'll discuss, we'll have a vote to uh, add Mr. Brown to the presentation portion of the agenda. So we'll call the question, all those in favor of, ask, of adding Mr. Brown. That's one, two, three, just say, keep your hands up. One, two, three, four, five, and that motion carries. So Mr. Brown has been added to the agenda. So now we're discussing uh, new business under H1. Um, so Chair, uh, can I just, as a point of order, um, given that Mr. Brown just been added, can I ask through you to the appropriate staff member that Mr. Brown be sent a link uh, so that he can uh, join when it's his turn? Uh, I'm sure staff can do that because they were in communication with him earlier. So we'll leave that up to him. Okay, we're now talking about uh, addition of H1 for Trustee Duncan's motion. Trustee Duncan, to close. Sure, I mean, I'll do an opening and a close. So I, essentially, um, I'm hearing uh, my colleagues, uh, some of them have some concerns about adding an item under a new business. Um, the issue is uh, emergent and it is also time sensitive. Um, my hope would be that uh, bringing it to the standing committee, albeit um, at shorter notice than we would like, uh, it gives us an, an opportunity and also staff an opportunity to discuss the issues 
uh, seek some clarity. Um, I did have a, a brief call with the interim superintendent this morning, um, and she informed me that uh, she had reached out to staff uh, to, to, to ask them to do their best to be in a position to uh, help us navigate the issue tonight. And I appreciate that um, that also means uh, potentially clarifying matters over the week uh, leading up to the board meeting, but I think we would be remiss not to take the opportunity tonight at the standing committee to have that more detailed um, discussion uh, in preparation for the board meeting, which is not uh, an, an easy venue. Uh, when we get to the board meeting, as you all know, it's more difficult to have more in-depth um, discussion and to have the kind of input and back and forth with both the community and, and with staff. So okay. I hope you support adding it uh, to the agenda. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go back here. Okay, all those in favor of adding H1, uh, Trustee Duncan's motion to the agenda, please put your hand up and keep them up. Thank you. Two. And three, and now all opposed? Just a minute. And the motion fails. So we do have Mr. Brown added to the agenda and we do not have the, um, the new motion added to the agenda. So could I have approval of the amended agenda, please? All those in favor? And all those opposed? Okay, we'll signify that Trustee Duncan and Trustee Whitaker are opposed. Approval of the minutes of May the 9th. Could someone approve the minutes, please? Uh, Trustee Painter, thank you very much. Uh, all those in favor of the minutes of the 9th? Okay, and that is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, business, any business arising? Sorry, Elaine, it's Kelly here. Hi. Kelly. I was I was sending the email and I lost track of that last vote. Are you able to let me know who voted for the motion and who voted against the motion? The motion for the H1? New, yes, please. Uh, it was all in favor except Trustee Duncan and Trustee Whitaker. Thank and you. And trustee Hensa, did you vote in favor of addition or that you're the only one I can't tell? Uh, of the addition to the agenda, yes. I voted in favor. Thank you. So all those in favor except trustee Duncan and trustee Whitaker. Sorry, Kelly. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay, so uh, there was no business arising. Point of order, point yes. of order. That's incorrect. A trustee Hensa voted in favor of adding the motion. So it is Hensa, Duncan, and Whitaker that were in favor. Uh, that well, that's why I went back to Trustee Hensa because yeah, her, I hers think was the one I wasn't. Her, I wasn't. I but but I'm not going to say how she voted. So I that's why I went to her directly, and she said she voted in favor of it. So I'm not going to argue the point because I asked her directly. Um, we have presentations to the committee now, so I'd like to welcome the Spectrum Secondary Artificial Turf Project Committee, Mr. Bidney. You and your you and your folks are up. Welcome. Uh, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, we're we're here. Uh, lucky to be here again in front of you all. We're really privileged to be here tonight. As our, our we've got quite a bit of a team here. Uh, we have about ten of us in the room tonight, and uh, I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Don Butcher, who's been uh, behind this for over five years, five years now, Dom. And I think this is the appropriate person to speak and to start us off this evening to, to discuss uh, this wonderful project. Thank you. Great, thank you. Hopefully you can hear me. You can give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Yeah. Fantastic. Thumbs up. If you could um, share the, the presentation. Thank you so much, Andy. And um, if I can get you to, to, to click the next slide, please and thank you. Yeah, so... Um, it's, it's great to be talking with you about this. I'm very excited about it. I've been excited for five years. As a, as a Marigold and future Spectrum parent, I'm very much vested in this project, as are the people around the table. And, and, and we bring a lot of enthusiasm and excitement about this project. And, and we know that, that talking with, with, with the people on the, on the Zoom meeting, you're excited about it too. Um, 
as we know, it's a $2.2 million project. The, the project has gone up uh, over the recent months uh, and year uh, due to inflation. Um, we know it's a stakeholder-based project. Uh, there's no cost to the district. It, it, we want to build on that agreement in principle. We've worked with the secretary, treasurer, and the facilities director for the last two years, and we want to advance that project into a, a formalization stage. Next slide, please, Andy. Um, here are the stakeholders. Um, we've got the Vancouver Island Soccer League, Victoria Spartans, Greater Victoria Minor Football Association. We've got McElhaney that has come on board, uh, and we're very excited to have uh, the Songhees Nation with us too. Uh, they, they've uh, I've written a letter of support, and we very much see this project as not only a, a sports field to benefit uh, uh, local regional sports, but it's also a means uh, towards reconciliation. Thank you. Next slide. Here's the legal structure, uh, a potential legal structure of a draft agreement. So we have the VISL, the Vancouver Island Soccer League, as a major partner. They would have the joint use agreement with, with uh, SD61. And under that, there would be some sub joint use agreements with the Victoria Spartans, Greater Victoria Minor Football Association, Football Association, and other potential stakeholders that might come in. Next slide, please. Uh, the, that joint use agreement, uh, it's kind of very much in a, a draft stage, but we, we hope uh, to work with the secretary treasurer further to co-construct it. Um, and it's modeled very much on the Oak Bay High Base United joint use agreement that was established a number of years ago. Next slide, please. The field, there it is. Uh, it's a FIFA uh, field. It's also a high school football um, uh, size field. It's, it's been designed in consultation with the facilities director and Saanich to maximize green space. And so uh, we've, we've been working uh, with facilities to, to outline a, a design for hopeful approval in, in months to come. Next slide, please. There is the concept layout in a 3D format. And the next slide, at a, at a bird's eye view there, you can see the field and the school in, a, in all its glory. Next slide, please. Here's the financial plan. Um, we know that the cost uh, with 12% um, inflation factor then with contingency and escalation, escalation, there we go, we got it out. It's all factored in there. James uh, uh, Postons, who used to work for the district, has actually uh, worked with us for the last two or three years. So great to have him on the number side. Uh, and we know that this, this is financially sustainable uh, at no cost to the district. Uh, and that includes the kind of utilities, the maintenance and the replacement of the turf after 10 years. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, at no cost to the, the district, this is a very much a needed community amenity and hopefully our stakeholders uh, will have a chance to talk briefly and, and really speak to that. Uh, we know uh, that we have a really enthusiastic and engaged stakeholder group. Uh, there's a desire to invest in the project and, and actually they've asked us if we can take the money. They're so keen to get involved. Um, we have $1 million in hand and we have a plan to fund the remaining amount. It, as I mentioned before, it's a long-term sustainable uh, project. Uh, we have a, a model for uh, the legal entity and the joint use agreement. Uh, no risk to the district. And we hope uh, that in the, in the coming weeks to months, we can advance the project to the next step by entering into a joint use agreement, a formal joint use agreement for the construction, maintenance and operation of the turf project. Uh, I'd just like to introduce you to Ian Sander uh, of McElhaney, uh, grad class uh, 1991 at Spectrum. Um, Ian, did you want to say a few words? No, I just, uh, thanks for, for letting us be part of this. We, we, we really uh, have enjoyed it and uh, just looking forward to uh, giving back a little bit. So uh, exciting, thanks very much. Thank you, Ian. And, and to my right here, your left is, is Vince Greco of the Vancouver Island Soccer League. Just right here. There he is. Would you like to say a few words? Yeah, uh, these are exciting times for, for us as a soccer league and the community. So um, while I have personally have only been involved for four and a half years as opposed to Dom's five, um, <laughs> it, it's definitely been uh, a process and we're sort of excited to get to the next level. And, and hopefully if we can 
moving ahead, we can sort of get to that next stage of um, speaking bluntly just to get more money in and move it to the next level of uh, making this come uh, to be a reality, more of a reality. And over to my, my far right here is Alan Lavoy of Victoria's Park. Right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to speak for uh, minor football in general because you know, our other stakeholder here could not make it tonight, but I'm going to speak on both of our behalfs. For minor football, which is we desperately need facilities, we need lit facilities and uh, fields that we can play football on. They're very, very few. There's really only two fields in all of the capital region that uh, you can play football on. So this is de desperately needed. Uh, our stakeholder group uh, runs from kids eight years old to 18. And we have uh, all, all co-ed, boys and girls. And we also have um, a lot of First Nations families uh, are members of our association. Uh, and the Esquimalt Nation uh, is very involved with our association as well. And they're going to join us as well and support us in any way they can uh, to support our stakeholder portion of this project. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much once again. Yeah, I, um, I just uh, just like to say thanks again, and and uh, just to speak on behalf of the, the football um, groups that with the state of Victoria Spartans, um, they've been using our field this year, uh, and it's been so exciting to see the activities in the evenings with all the little kids out there, so cute watching them play football, and it's just bringing that community spirit back to our school, and I this shows you uh, how how um, how important such a um, project is to, to build community and it's just such an honor to be in the room with all these different uh, members of our community and uh, really exciting about what this project could mean for not only the district but but most importantly our community so i think what we'd like to do is leave it to the trustees now if, if we have an opportunity to answer any questions Great. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation um, and for you all being there. I did phone Dom earlier today and asked him what I felt was a, a ton of questions. So I'll see what other trustees uh, have uh, in mind for you. And then um, I might ask, ask a couple of mine just so they're in the public records. So do we have any trustees who would like to ask some questions? I'm just looking for hands here. Trustee Painter. Thank you, Chair. Um, so just first off, uh, congrats on getting so many people in one room together, uh, COVID being what it is and all the challenges and scary things we've all been through in the last two years. It's actually really exciting to see a bunch of people come together in a room with uh, a single purpose to get something pretty, pretty cool uh, and exciting done in the district. So um, just congrats on that. My question around the is really around the funding side. Um, I come from uh, the nonprofit world, uh, doing work in the nonprofit sector. And I know how challenged uh, things are right now um, in terms of grant funding and getting grants and um, things are certainly seeming to dry up fast and, and quick, uh, certainly as we seem to be entering into some challenging economic times. So I'm wondering what uh, I know, I know that there are contingency plans. I'm just wondering if you could walk us through a bit more of kind of the contingency planning that you guys may have done um, in, you know, potentially anticipating uh, some funding sources, maybe not being quite as lucrative as we hope. Um, and uh, I guess the only other thing, you know, I'll put that there for now and then I'll follow up with my question after I get an answer. Thanks. Thank you. Gentlemen. Yeah, in terms of uh, funding the remainder of the, the field, uh, I know that the three stakeholder groups all are kind of active and engaged in, in looking at grants, uh, the, the BC uh, Gaming Capital Project grants. The, the season is just open on that front, and so our groups are active uh, with that. I know, Adam, you, you're, um, you, you're talking about grants with, uh, with the Victoria Spartans. Um, and so, yeah, we, we hope to further uh, the fundraising by having those, those grants and having those applications. Definitely a joint use agreement. Um, hopefully by September will definitely allow the grants to, to uh, be stronger. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's our hope uh, that we do well in the grant process. If not, we've got, we've got uh, an enthusiastic and, and 
you know, local uh, associations and regional associations that, that have the potential to, to fundraise uh, great sums uh, as well. Awesome. Thanks. You've got a lot of star power there. Chair, I'll, I'll pass it off uh, to my colleagues. I, I, the other question may have been answered, so I'll let it go. And then if I have it, we can come back around a second time. Thanks. Okay. Trustee Whitaker, I saw your hand up. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you very much, guys. I have to say it's been a lot of fun actually watching your group come together and move forward and enjoying the work that you're doing. Knowing that you guys are having fun coming together, I just know that this will, will continue to move forward. I also really liked hearing about the co-ed options. Um, I know that there is a lot of demand for that in the district, so I'm, I'm glad to hear about that. Um, what I didn't see in the picture were any stands uh, for spectators, and I wondered if that was something down the road that you had considered. Definitely, yeah. We've we've had those conversations within our working groups, and and uh, you know it's it's important that people can come out and, and watch uh, the, the sporting events at the school and out in the community. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, in going back to the previous question, I know that um, uh, Adam had uh, something else to add on the, the uh, um, funding the, uh, the, the gap. So yeah, going back to Ryan, Ryan's question there, uh, of course, we're going out to, to the provincial and the community grant uh, options that we have, uh, but we have a strong, a strong commitment from local contractors and local businesses based not only on the sanitary or Victoria swine malt elsewhere that, that want to be involved with the construction process of this. Um, so it's not so much an application just to ask for some money from the province. Uh, we're getting some blood, sweat and tears from the local contractors that, you know, they may have had children that went to this school or they see the value of having their kids go through a program where they can have soccer and football and those options. So um, th th there is definitely a commitment that we have uh, and from, from donations in lieu and, and also uh, just the interest from other parties. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions from trustees on this? Okay, um, I'm just going to ask a couple that I did speak with Dom about earlier today, and um, it's it's not so much concerns; it's just uh, to make sure we dot all the I's and cross all the T's. Um, we really um, value community consultation at the district and going forward, so that all of the neighbors know, all of the school community know what's happening before it starts to happen. And I asked the question, had you had the group embarked on any community consultation yet? And um, the answer was sort of informally, but not specifically. So I'm just flagging that as something that may be required um, before we proceed any farther. And um, just even the plan to, to move it along and get out there. So. Um, so we, we hope to hear about something about that. Cause like I said, when the bulldozers pour in and the neighbors go, oh my goodness, what's going on there? Um, we want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Um, the, um, da -da -da. the other one I was concerned about that I was questioning was um, uh, rentals to the district. So in your overview of the financials, it looked like the, um, we were subletting to the first organization or joint use agreement, first organization, then they were subletting to uh, everybody else. And so I didn't know if the district currently receives revenues from rentals of the field spectrum, and then we're not going to receive any further revenues. So that would be a decrease in revenues from, from um our perspective at the board. So that's a question that staff will have to get back to us on. And with, you know, when we get to a formal, a formal presentation and a formal motion that would come forward at some point in time, that I would want to know that. Um, and the second thing was, sorry. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I, yep. um, from that question today, I reached out to the district and the rental rate, um, the rental rate for the district at Oak Bay High was very, very similar to the number that we had in the plan. And also the, there would be one grass field still left behind. So even though we would have the turf field, the grass field would still be there for rental. So oh, okay. It, okay. thinking about it, it wouldn't, uh, 
count out any additional grass field rentals because we still have that. Excellent. Well, that helps me with that question. Thank you. Um, and then the other question I asked was, um, um, I know that we had talked, to, you had talked about in your presentation about in-kind donations and that, that they had initially been improved by the staff. And I just, it would have to be then um, one step further, they would have to be vetted for collective agreement, um, uh, making sure that they mesh with our collective agreements, that they're qualified contractors, that the warranties are all there and WCB are all, con um, all included in all of those. So just that, that beyond them having an initial discussion that staff said you could use contractors, we would still have to make sure that they were vetted at a district level to make sure that everything was uh, moving forward so that all the liabilities were looked after. So um, I think those were my, um, the only questions I had outstanding that um, before we ever got to anything formal, I would need to, to have those questions answered. But thank you so much. I'll just go through the Trustees, one more time, I'll scroll through and see if there's any other questions. Okay, seeing none. Thank you, gentlemen, and Audrey, I saw you over there in the corner there too. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your presentation to us, and uh, we look forward to the next time. Thank awesome. you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thank you. Okay, moving on, our next presentation is uh, Dogwoods Beyond Gas, Graham Tarling. Hi there, good evening. Great, welcome. You uh, have, we're set for your presentation, thank you. Yeah, I've got a presentation. If somebody could queue up the first page, that'd be great. Well, Graham, let me just check I've got that. Um, what's the title of the presentation, please. I'm not sure I have that one saved. Sorry, the title of it? Is it a, is it a PowerPoint presentation or a PDF? Yeah, it is PowerPoint. Oh, it's uh, SD61 Climate Action Plan. Thank you. Okay. And this is B2 version? The which version, sorry? B2, I believe. I think there were two two versions of this presentation. Yeah, I think Kelly made a couple of um, adjustments to it. Okay, hearing that now, thank you. Protect the innocent. Yeah. Hi, Andy, I just emailed it to you. Thank you. I, I do have it here. My apologies. I was getting my presenters mixed up, so I'll, I'll own this one. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm sharing. Let me just remove the notes. Does that look right? That looks great, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, on uh, behalf of Dogwood, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all this evening. And before I start, I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you from the unceded territories of the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. So my presentation this evening is in response to May's climate action report to this committee. In that report were the following statements. Number one, SD61 has committed to decreasing their greenhouse gas emissions by 50% from 2010 levels by the year 2030. Number two, if SD61 adheres to the current plan of upgrading old gas heating boilers with new more efficient units, SD61 will only achieve a 40% reduction, which will be a significant miss. Number three, some electrification of the SD61 school buildings portfolio will be required in order to reach the 50% target. Okay, next slide, please. The fact that Cedar, the Cedar Hill Middle School project is using heat pumps, both ground source and air source, is a great step in the right direction. It is based on the benefits of heat pumps, which are, number one, they, make, uh, they are more than three times as efficient as a high efficiency gas furnace. Number two, they also provide efficient air conditioning. And number three, their operating temperature range is perfect for a climate like Victoria. Number four, the price of electricity in BC is relatively stable, especially compared to gas. Number five, they generate exceedingly low upstream emissions and zero downstream emissions. 
Six, they will create no harmful air pollution in the school environment. Number seven, following an earthquake, they cannot cause an explosion, unlike potentially gas. Next slide, please. Uh, May's report referred to high electrification quotes, which I believe are sourced from the CHMS Energy Options document. A couple of questions. Number one, how does the cost of gas used in the comparisons relate to the current market price? And number two, all heat pump options include a mandated, expensive and essentially redundant gas backup boiler. SD61 should challenge this BC mandate and ask what is the rationale given for given Victoria's mild climate suits heat pumps so well. In addition, potential sources of funding could be in 2020, 2021, BCSTA advocacy increased the Ministry of Education's carbon neutral capital program to $16.7 million per year. This program is to help school districts reduce their emissions so HVAC system upgrades would qualify. This should be added to the capital plan to budget for the electrification of two systems per year. Has staff actively uh, been pursuing any of this funding? If not, will the trustees direct them to do so now? Lastly, schools that are air conditioned with heat pumps should be offered as community cooling centers in the event of future heat domes a need identified by the recently released BC coroner's report into the devastating 2021 heat dome. This benefit could leverage additional funding. Next slide, please. Renewable natural gas has a few issues. Number one, the current gas supply contains just 1% of RNG. 80% of the rest is high emissions, destructive fracked gas. Their ambitious RNG volume projections need to be independently verified. Number two, the carbon tax on the fracked gas content will continue to push up the cost of the gas supply. Number three, Fortis plans to produce RNG from many different sources, ranging from landfill landfill methane capture, which is low emissions intensity, but also a very low projected volume, to non-renewable blue hydrogen, which is high emissions and will form a large part of the uh, future volumes. Number four, the entire gas network leaks as much as 9% in the form of methane, which is 85 times worse than CO2 with respect to emissions intensity. Number five, all gas, regardless of the source, behaves the same when burned by customers, generating local air pollution and carbon dioxide. Number six, Fortis puts a lot of time and money into slowing climate change initiatives, such as fighting legislation that promotes electrification through its membership of an international consortium called the Energy Solution Center. Okay, last slide, please. The climate clock continues to tick towards midnight and SD61 has just eight years to bend the greenhouse gas emissions curve down to meet their 2030 target. Implementation of electric heat pumps is the only sure strategy for SD61 to reduce emissions quickly enough. An implementation program to replace end of life gas boil Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Graham. Uh, uh, quite often uh, we ask presenters if they can forward us their slide deck after, just so we have a copy of it. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, then we have it as a record for our, for our notes moving forward. So that'd be great. Uh, any yeah. trustees have any questions? Sorry, uh, do you have that copy from uh, Mr. Cantley or do you want me to send it? Uh, well, it's a, and Ke Kelly must have it, so we'll, we'll get Kelly to send it to us tomorrow. Okay, Great. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Whitaker? Thank you. I just wanted to thank you for your presentation. A lot of information there. I, I'm continually learning more and more 
um, uh, about like there's obviously so much to learn. And I just wanted to also how inventive and creative to consider schools in the summertime as cooling centers. I think that was that was brilliant. And, you know, as we're hearing about, you know, the lack of childcare in some areas and the need to open schools for that as well, you know, just re brings up the conversation. What are our school buildings in our community? So thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you. Trustee Painter and then, and then Duncan. Yeah, thank you. Uh, really, Graham, appreciate the presentation. Uh, everything that uh, comes forward from, from Dogwood is always very informative. Uh, <laughs> never challenged with data, which uh, I certainly appreciate. Um, and, and well presented. Uh, very good job. My, you, you had a specific question about the CNCP. Um, and I did just want to turn to staff. Uh, we do receive CNCP funding. Uh, of course, I don't have this, the, the number uh, in front of me, but staff perhaps, they probably don't have the number in front of them too, but they can maybe let us know more generally um, what kinds of CNCP funding we get, um, frequency that we get it, those kinds of pieces. Kim, sorry, I know I threw that right at you. Um, please don't feel like you need to be specific, but just to provide a, a roundabout answer for, for Graham. So Secretary yeah. Treasurer. Oh, sorry, uh, thank you. Uh, through our uh, annual five-year capital planning process, uh, so we submit uh, an annual capital plan on a uh, rolling five-year basis to the ministry. And one of the funding pots that the ministry provides is CNCP, and we do take advantage of that every year along with uh, the other 59 school districts. And so as you can imagine, uh, if we put in five projects and 59 other school districts put in uh, 50, you know, five projects, there's uh, quite a few projects in the province. And so uh, I, I think the idea is that each district gets a little bit of uh, funding each year. And I, I think we generally have between uh, one and two projects approved each year. Uh, and in fact, if you were to look on tonight's agenda, uh, again, there's the draft uh, submission that the board is hopefully going to approve on Monday to be submitted. And you can see the types of um, projects that we've uh, put forward. So anything from a boiler to uh, boiler replacement, et cetera. So. Chair, if I may have one quick follow-up. Yep. Uh, Graham, uh, just back to you and Dogwood. Uh, again, appreciate you coming and presenting information. Of course, as you know, we are able to do what we can in our district based on the funding that we receive. Um, and we are always hoping that the province is able to fund all that we can ask for. Certainly one of the more recent challenges we had was with uh, Cedar Hill and trying to go to a complete net zero, but being prevented to because of BC Hydro's net metering cap. We have advocated locally and at the provincial level for BC Hydro to lift that cap. So if your organization could help advocate uh, alongside with us to lift that cap, that would help ensure that we can bring uh, our schools and our capital projects as close to net zero, if not net zero as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Duncan. Yeah, I, I also just wanted to echo my colleagues' uh, sentiments. Thank you so much for coming and uh, presenting tonight. Uh, appreciate all, all the high quality of the presentation and on all the information and unique ideas. Uh, certainly um, the community resource that schools could be um, in the future where we are in the midst of a heat dome, um, you know, very creative um, and very logical suggestion. Uh, and, and, you know, also, I think, pointing out that in Victoria and, and in other school districts, um, the requirement to have gas boiler backups, um, you know, does need to be reviewed in light of our climate and our increasingly warm cl climate. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to point out uh, in our pack up on page 35, um, for the benefit of uh, uh, the presenter, uh, it outlines our CNCP request. Um, and we're asking for three uh, and a quarter million dollars for various projects, um, which do include um, replacing boilers. Uh, but I believe we'll get into this later in the agenda, but I believe uh, those requests at the moment anyway, uh, are requesting uh, uh, gas boilers. So um, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to raise these issues. And I expect that some of what you've suggested will be part of our discussion tonight. So thanks again. Great. Thank you again so much for you coming, Graham, to uh, present to us this evening and um, wish you well on your, on your endeavors to get us down to net zero. And if uh, Dogwood can be of any help whatsoever in providing any more information, please let us know, because I know 
I mean, obviously, all school di districts are underfunded, and it's yeah, it's trying to find creative ways to get the funding to do the right thing. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we're moving on B3, Parents for Climate, uh, Kate Laws. Do we have Kate here? Andy, do you see Kate anywhere? I do not care. Okay, well, we'll check with I get back at the end of the presentations, see if she's here. Uh, B4, uh, Climate, Isabella. Welcome back to the board table and the floor is yours. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Dogwood and with Graham today to talk about um, implementing electric heating in schools and how that can be beneficial and the student perspective on that. So um, my name is Isabella Miskevich, and I've been a student at Esquimalt High School for four years now. I'm just about to graduate. And over the course of my schooling, the district has made it very evident what they stand for. They stand for things like respect and honesty and inclusivity. But most importantly, I have observed they really seem to care about my future as a student. The continued use of gas heating in our buildings contradicts this value. Continuing to emit greenhouse gases does not support my future. The introduction of electric heating is not only beneficial for our climate, it is beneficial to the future of the students currently in the district. The students who will have to live through the global rise in temperatures and the polar bears going extinct, the students who will have to continue to cope with climate anxiety. The first step to supporting students in their future is ensuring that they will have one. Please keep your promise and decrease greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030. As Graham said, using electric heating in our buildings is the only way to guarantee that this goal is met. Cedar Hill Middle School is a great place to start. And before I leave the district, it would be comforting to know that we are taking a stance against the use of natural gas. The district needs to take initiative and prove to their students that they are invested in our futures. So once again, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak and I just wanted to come in to give a little bit of student voice on this um, because I really think this opportunity is important to grasp and it is important to make change. So yeah, I hope I've contributed. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for, for uh, coming and backing up uh, some of uh, Graham's um, efforts there and from a student perspective, that was awesome. So thank you so much. Uh, we would as a district do many more of these projects if the funding was there. So we are trying to move forward with the funding. So anything you wanna do and advocate to the government to move that along is very helpful for all of us. So thank you again for, thank you again for presenting. Uh, we have added uh, Mr. Jesse Brown to the agenda this evening. So I see him in the waiting room, there he goes. So, Mr. Brown. Hi there. Welcome. Hi, thanks for uh, making the time to see me today. Uh, my name is Jesse. I'm the coordinator of the Victoria High Learning Farm, and I'm the owner of Mason Street Farm. Um, seven years ago, we formed a unique partnership with the school district to bring in experienced farmers and um, expand on the, the Vic High Learning Garden and create a, a, a large functional farm that was managed and maintained by um, a local farm and um, whose priority was to educate Vic High students on um, everything about growing food, uh, working, um, working in groups to uh, yeah, provide a, an imperative um, commodity for the community. So it is a fully functioning farm and it has been operating now for seven years. Uh, in that time, we have seen, we've, we've run over 700 students through um, that garden. We meet on Tuesdays. So right now we have two, full, two blocks. So it's two full, uh, one full day of the week. Um, and students come together, do a tour, uh, they see what's happening in the garden at that time. We do a little learning project and then um, mostly hands-on work from there. Um, yeah, it's been a really um, amazing and fun project. Um, yeah, and why I'm speaking today is there's uh, a little bit of a challenge with the construction going on. And um, yeah, we've been informed that there is a need to temporarily halt the operation of the farm. And that's um, providing uh, significant challenges for this project to continue. 
Um, yeah, and I, I'm happy to go into that. Um, but um, yeah, this this over the last seven years, um, we've worked with these classes, and yeah, it's really opened up a pathway for students to um, have opportunities in the food sector outside of this garden. Um, we see classes each week. Some of those students that are keen, they'll come work in the garden club. Um, some of those students who are really keen um, have gone on to work uh, and partake in the Life Cycle Seed the City summer internship program, which is a work experience. Um, and we've also uh, hosted students for our paid summer apprenticeship program. Currently, uh, Eden Murray, one of our original students seven years ago, she is now actually involved in the teaching of the learning farm. Um, so yeah, there is a real uh, pathway here for um, students to gain meaningful uh, employment in this sector. Um, the project was initially seeded uh, with a $10,000 grant from Van City. Um, since then, uh, we have taken over the complete financial responsibility for the project, uh, which to this date has cost $170,000, a little bit over. Um, our current operating budget annually is $46,500. The challenge is the only mechanism, um, and actually one of the great mechanisms about this project is that it's fully self-funded through the sale of produce. So all produce that is uh, grown on that property with students and also with staff from Mason Street Farm and faculty um, is, is sold and that money is entirely responsible for the complete operation, including materials, seeds, coordination, um, soil, compost, uh, all materials required for function of the farm and wages for teachers and staff. Um, yeah, this site produces over five tons of produce annually. Um, we feed 70 families in a weekly box program, 15 restaurants, six grocers, and um, whatever food that the school wants they get for free. Um, so yeah, I understand the construction needs to happen. Um, I've been informed that it's now going to go ahead uh, in July and that will, we're expecting it to uh, cause a disruption, a complete disruption of about 60% of the farm. Um, there was an initial attempt to or hope that we would be able to temporarily move the space over to the adjacent um, field. Um, upon doing the financials and uh, doing some research on that strategy, it's proven to be both financially and ecologically impossible. Um, which, yeah, I've, I've let the school district know about this. Um, yeah, I, I just didn't have enough warning to be able to do this early enough. Um, one of the ways that the primary function financially of a farm all of the planning and all of our, um, the pri primary work of the farm and investment of, of an agricultural project happens between the months of January and May. And it's really only May through October that we're actually um, producing and uh, uh, yielding food and therefore bringing in income. And the challenge here was that we were just informed uh, March 18th that this would need to happen. Um, by that time, um, most of our primary investments, all of our planning, um, all of the shares in our box program uh, were already um, uh, paid for. So we're in quite a bind. Um, and we're asking that the school district consider postponing this construction until September 15th, at which time we will be three quarters of the way through our season and we will have been able to produce enough food to cover costs and uh, fulfill our CSA requirements um, and voluntarily vacate that space and consider the memorandum of understanding that is drafted between our organization and the school um, to, to continue to be valid. Um, 
yeah, that's that's kind of the main request. Um, another piece is the indigenous garden that is neighboring the food production garden. Um, it's about 10 years old now and contains uh, indigenous medicinal plants and there's also a Gary Oak ecosystem. And it's my understanding, I'm not fully clear on the details, but significant portions of some of that will need to be moved temporarily. Um, it's a pretty sensitive uh, ecosystem, uh, sensitive plants. They've been blessed by uh, First Nations elders in the region. Um, so there is actually a little bit of planning and funding required to do that uh, safely and uh, with respect. Um, I don't know what that funding is, but um, I don't know what's required for that exactly, but that's where the consultation comes in. Um, yeah, if uh, basically where we're at, um, <laughs> It's, it's hard to say, it's hard to say this, but yeah, if, if this project goes ahead before September 15th, uh, this will bankrupt this project at the farm. Um, there isn't much a way that we could, would be able to carry on. Uh, it would be quite devastating and it would, yeah, it would also be um, a dislocation of the memor memorandum of understanding that we have written between us. So we're really hoping to find a solution um, so that we can keep offering these students and faculty this um, amazing experience. We've got some very active and engaged faculty and students who adore this project and show up rain or shine to an unbelievable degree. They've had options to go back to class and make hot chocolate um, in some of our uh, relentless winter rainstorms that we've had. And I, I'm not lying, I can't believe this actually happened, but a show of hands showed that they wanted to stay and uh, play in the mud and grow food. <laughs> so that's just been our consistent experience. Teachers walk away from this, like thanking us and shocked at how invested and involved their students are and how engaged they are in this project. Um, it's really all smiles and laughter and communication out there amongst students that I don't think usually talk to each other in the class. So it's a really unique space and we love this work. Um, we just need a little bit of a delay um, and a show of, yeah, just, it would be also nice to, to feel a show of support from the district that this work that we do, that the district doesn't have to pay anything for um, is valued. Thank, thank you for your thank you for your presentation. So um, I know that um, I, I I think I saw Trustee Whitaker's hand up. Yeah. So in, in a second we'll get to Trustee Whitaker. Um, so I things like this that come up as an emergent issue or come up as asking for something specific, um, trustees try not to jump on a decision tonight without getting input from staff and staff have not had the opportunity to provide us with the background or a report so to speak um, for us so I, I wouldn't anticipate that we'll have uh, any kind of a decision for you tonight but I'll let trustees um, ask some questions if they have any questions of you and then we would uh, I would assume um, have this discussion with a staff report uh, to answer some of the concerns that you have and some of the questions that the uh, trustees may have uh, in response to your presentation. So Trustee Whitaker. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much uh, for your presentation and thanks for letting me know where Eden has arrived. Uh -huh. uh, it was lovely watching her seven years ago oh. and just tr completely transform from um, maybe... Anyway, yeah, just yeah. it was it was night and day, night and day. So thank you for the work uh, that uh, you and your team had with with her, uh, and I'm happy to hear that she's still involved. Um, I guess really my questions aren't necessarily for you. Uh, you've done a good job of explaining that you know you're looking for September 15th and what what your challenges are. But I think you know it's important to. Um, for me to put some questions out to staff. And I guess I, my questions will be, so 
in the greater scheme of things within this construction, if within your report, it can come back and say, so what, why is it that it has to be at this timeline in, in the process of everything? And is there a way to, to push that back as requested? I think, you know, for me, um, I'm kind of hopeful within this. I, I do think that there's a lot of free food that is going across the street as well, not just to Vic High. Um, so I'm hopeful that throughout the summer when this is a hard time to see our families fed that I don't know what happens there, but I would hope that some of this would, this uh, food is available for some of those families. Um, I'm also curious about the indigenous garden and um, if there is a plan, if we are going to do this and this is going to disrupt that, have we reached out to the nations or to ensure that we're, we do follow proper protocol um, to, to, to move or to do whatever it is that you need to do to that piece of the garden to put in the, the storm drains or um, so I'm looking for that answer to come back as well, that we've, we've done that, because I think that might hold up things as well. Uh, if we, you know, suddenly were taken by surprise with that. Um, no, I think that those were my two, two big questions. And then maybe for Mr. Brown. So what, once the renovations are all done at Vic High, what is the plan for the program? Like you, you said you were vacating. So are we not doing the program anymore or will students come to the Mason Street or we don't know? Once, yeah, once the um, construction is complete, we will need to put the, field, the main field that's disturbed fallow uh, and give it a cover crop probably for a year to um, repair uh, the damaged soil. Um, the, there is further construction that is, I've been told, is going to need to happen. Portions of the annual production farm are going to need to be moved to make way for the uh, child care centre. So that's, there's a little bit of unknown for, for me. I don't know the details of that and the timing of that. So I, we are definitely committed and able to continue with um, educational opportunities on this site for 2023. It'll just be a smaller pared down version until construction finishes and the fields repaired. Um, uh, the faculty that I work with, we have agreed to definitely next year continue the garden club, which is the, the students that what Eden actually started um, seven or eight years ago. Um, that will definitely continue, which is um, I'm involved personally in that. Um, and whatever, however we can get classes on whatever size of space that's available, we will. Um, once the area is clear, uh, we will commence with the full programming. Thank well, thank you. you for your continued commitment. That's for sure. Thanks. Yes. Trustee Duncan. Yeah, um, I just want to say um, thank you to, to Mr. Brown for uh, coming here tonight. Uh, for uh, raising raising the, the concern. Um, I'm hopeful uh, that through uh, the board's consideration of a motion at the board meeting on Monday uh, and uh, within the next week, uh, staff will be able to prepare uh, to contribute to those discussions. Um, and, you know, I, I, these kinds of programs are so unique, so rare. Um, and, and so innovative in today's modern urban culture that we're all living in. Um, and there's such a huge, in my view, healing component um, for students and I imagine for staff too in participating in this kind of work, uh, which is, well, it's, it's just a very rare, unique and special opportunity. And I just want to acknowledge that and acknowledge all the many, many years of work um, that you and, and your colleagues and, and partners um, in our staff have put in to, to make this happen for students. So I'm really, I, I have to be hopeful that in the next week we can all put our heads together in good faith and, and look for a solution that will preserve all that hard work that you've done. Um, and, you know, I certainly was struck by um, some of the impacts, not only on our students, but also on the community if you were to lose uh, so much of, uh, of your yield, uh, in particular, the, the, the families that, that, uh, that you deliver food boxes to, um, but also all the local businesses that are relying on, on the crop 
I wonder um, if I might ask you to kind of clarify uh, in terms of who utilizes the crop, um, you know, if you were to lose uh, all the crop, how would you fulfill your commitments, the commitments that have been made through the program to provide uh, that produce? How, how would you uh, fulfill those commitments in absence of the, of the crop? Yeah, the the loss of the space that is that I, that has been identified. That's my understanding. Roughly sixty percent of this um, farm would would be about uh, forty percent, thirty five to forty percent of our entire growable space. Um, the options right now that I'm thinking of, uh, you know, will drastically lose um, production. Um, yeah, the I mean the the CSA share members they pay up front. <clears throat> so I mean one option is that they uh, just don't get some of their food. Um, we would try to funnel produce or um, income from the sale of produce, certain like salad greens and things that we grow large quantities of. Uh, we would potentially try to purchase food from other local farms in order to keep that uh, the C CSA shareholders um, with an actual full uh, spectrum of produce that they've paid for. Um, that's really not ideal. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the loss of this space uh, would uh, cause a 16 to $20,000 dip in our revenue. So that's just a lot to make up for. Um, I would have to uh, at least shorten hours of staff. We, we staff the project uh, and my farm with six people. So um, hours would be reduced or layoffs would be incurred. And so if I may chair, just one follow up and um, yep. thank you. Yeah, so, so what I'm hearing is that um, not only would have direct impacts on on you and and your staff, but also that it would potentially mean the the end of this program moving forward. It would be a pretty um, morally uh, internal destructive experience to um, be blindsided this way, and for our work to not be valued financially. It would be a significant hit and. Um, yeah, the, I, I, this project, we would have to walk away from it. It's to, it would be, um, it would cost, it's already going to cost us a lot to uh, repair this field. Like, we're not asking the school for that money. Um, the loss in revenue of losing that space for a year um, while continuing the educational programming. Um, it's, we're going to drastically be paring back our operation already while this is recovered. We're prepared to do that. We understand construction needs to happen. It's just the timeline, um, when we were informed, um, it's, it's just makes it an unbearable, uh, it, beyond inconvenience. <laughs> no, I understand. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so we will, we will, uh, I expect, be revisiting this next week um, after staff have been able to go away and uh, they've heard questions from trustees and they've heard your concerns uh, in your presentation. So again, thank you very much for presenting on such short notice tonight and um, wish you a good evening. Uh, we're moving on to the superintendent's report. Superintendent Witten. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Leonard. You'll see on Beginning on page 16 through 18 is for information to be shared. Um, the purpose of the memo is to uh, bring to public's attention and to the board's attention that as of July 1st, uh, information regarding the fees that may be charged to complete some freedom of information request will be added to the district's website. And these charges align with uh, section 75 of the Freedom of Information and Privacy Protection of Privacy Act. Um, you'll see on page 18 of the pack up the processing fees that may be charged and those that may not be charged. So this does align with um, other policies and regulations as well as the uh, Protection of Privacy Act section 75. So that memo is there for your attention. And as I said, it will come onto the district website as of July 1st. 
Great, thank you so much. Okay, uh, Trustee Duncan. Yeah, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you to the interim superintendent um, for bringing the memo forward. Um, I appreciate uh, the um, detail that you've provided. Um, I wondered if I uh, uh, could just ask a question in terms of what will be on the website. Um, in terms of the uh, fees notice uh, that would need to be provided to a requester um, if fees were to be charged, um, are, is the plan to make uh, requesters aware uh, through what we post on the website about their right to appeal that fees notice uh, to ask for a review? Um, and also ultimately to appeal um, a fee, a proposed fee uh, to the Information and Privacy Commissioner. Um, yeah, I wonder if that's uh, part of the plan and, and, and if it isn't, um, you know, my friendly suggestion is that that might be included um, just to put us in good stead uh, should a, an appeal uh, go to, to the Commissioner. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other comments? Awesome, thank you so much for that. Uh, we're moving on, nothing under personnel, finance and legal, uh, Secretary Treasurer, monthly financial report. Thank you. Um, in the May report is attached for your information. Uh, at this point in the year, uh, we are about the same uh, position we were in last year uh, in salaries and benefits with 12% uh, remaining, same as last year. And in terms of our services and supplies, uh, we have 13% left to spend and we had 15% to spend at the same time last year. And just a reminder, our 10 month budgets should be um, at about 10% left and our 12 month budget should be at about 8% left. So we're sitting in good stead for year end and our surplus projections are coming in as planned. Of course, uh, schools and departments still have a month to spend. And so uh, we won't know the actual surplus until our year end is run. And uh, just to point out on page 22, there was a question from the May uh, operations policy and planning committee around the April report. And that is, uh, the answer to that is included on page 22 of this month's report or of your packet. Awesome, thank you for that answer to that question. Trustee Duncan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And thank you very much to the Secretary Treasurer for um, bringing that answer back. I, uh, page 22 of the packet, appreciate it. I just had one question in relation to the, uh, the answer uh, at the, t the second table or the, the continuation of the table under increased budget in 2021 to 22, um, you break down um, the miscellaneous services budget. Um, and so thank you again for that. One of the things that jumped out for me was uh, item three, uh, international student program facilitators. I just wondered um, if you could uh, provide some context around why um, ISP facilitators would be paid for out of a, a miscellaneous service budget rather than the ISP budget. Thank you. Secretary Treasurer. So we, yeah. So um, we have to remember that uh, there are lots of um, different accounts in, in our GL and the particular report that I bring you at this month end is by object. And so that's why all of the um, contracted services are rolled up into one line item. But within that line item, uh, there would be many uh, function program line items rolling up into there, um, which is more like schedule two or two C of the financial statements or the budget. And so uh, within the uh, miscellaneous and the contracted services last year and this year uh, would be uh, probably a myriad of accounts such as uh, regular classroom supplies, um, international students, uh, we can see post-secondary institution, pathway and partnership uh, type of contracts, et cetera. So there are many, which is a different function program than ISP. Uh, and so there's a, a, a whole bunch of uh, accounts that would roll up into this particular uh, reporting format by object. Uh, follow up, Trustee Duncan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, so just to clarify, to make sure I'm understanding um, what you're saying is that it would not be unusual to find an international student program um, expense such as um, facilitators included under 
either contracted services or miscellaneous services. Correct. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, moving along, we are going to annual, annual five-year plan. Uh, so whomever. not much to, oops, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, whomever. Okay. Carry on. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry. <laughs> Just, uh, I'm not going to spend much time here. Uh, we haven't changed the draft uh, five-year annual capital plan since it was presented last month. Uh, we know that the uh, committee and the board like to see the annual capital plan a month in advance of approving it. And so uh, since it hasn't changed from last month, we're asking that the board uh, pass a recommended motion uh, for the board to approve the submission of the annual capital plan on Monday. And I will say um, that the ministry has... Uh, requested three different motions and so on Monday you'll see the approval of the annual capital plan and then three motions for AFG uh, minor and major capital so we for tonight we're looking for a recommendation of the overall plan to Monday's meeting okay can I have the motion on the floor please trustee Duncan were you putting the motion on the floor um no? I actually wanted to discuss the the plan we will so, yeah the trustee Painter of course no. sure I'll do trustee that Painter, motions on the floor Yep. Okay, and Chelsea Duncan, you wish to discuss which which page are you looking at? Yeah, so um, I guess there's two. Well, we we can go to. Let me just see. It's uh, what I want to discuss in particular was the opportunities to um, through. I think primarily it's through the CNCP um, request to um, look to request. Uh, heat pumps rather than the, the gas fired boilers. This came up uh, last month uh, when we were considering uh, the climate accountability um, uh, report. And um, some of the uh, issues in terms of meeting our uh, 2030, uh, you know, GHG reduction targets uh, without taking some additional steps to um, electrify our, our heating and potentially in future our cooling. Um, so I was hoping that we could discuss uh, really amending the plan um, and correct me if I'm wrong through the chair to the secretary treasurer or to the relevant staff member. Most of, if not all of the requests currently in, in the uh, capital five-year capital plan uh, for boilers or for heating uh, mechanics um, would fall under the CNCP uh, funding envelope, or have I missed some requests uh, in other funding uh, envelopes regarding heating and cooling? Secretary Treasurer, uh, my understanding is that most would come through CNCP, uh, but I would call on uh, the Director of Facilities to confirm that. Mr. Morris, through the chair. There is opportunities under um, SEP, which is another grant. Right now, SEP is looking at phase two of some um, work and equipment that is slated for Vic High. So we cannot alter that one. And in regards to CNCP, we there might not be enough time to get an engineer in and validate uh, making a switch and, and ac accommodating everything that he's going to come up with with questions um, before this is submitted uh, by the end of the month. Thank you. So yeah, I would, I would have thought that um, uh, it could be a direction moving forward, but not necessarily to ask staff for costing and seeing the difference, but not necessarily in the time frame we have left before the end of the month. So, uh, Trustee Duncan, you have a follow up. Yeah, so I'd like to explore that a little bit, if I may. So, um, I guess first of all, um, I appreciate that um, if cost, if if when uh, undertaking the procurement exercise. Um, and recommending the gas fired boilers. There was no um, review of other options. I, I, I take that uh, by um, Director Morris's response. There was no other um, options such as uh, heat pumps considered during the procurement process. I guess that's my first question. 
Just, uh, Mr. Morris? Through the chair again. Um, a number of options were looked at, but the problem is if you're all heat pump, uh, even though we're in supposedly the most temperate climate in Canada, uh, it still does get cold and it still does freeze. If we have a power outage, there is nothing there to guarantee we won't freeze up any of the piping. So that's why there's talk of a at least a, a natural gas backup. Okay. Um, so if I may, um, through the chair. Yep. Um, Follow up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I I wanted to clarify the the provincial requirement for a natural gas backup. Um, my understanding is that's uh, that because it's a backup. Um, that would need to be in place regardless of whether a heat pump or a gas fired boiler was um, requested through CNCP. Is that right? Through the chair, um, to Mr. Morris? Uh, chair? Yep. I'd have to get some more information for you, Trustee. Um, there's a number of different things that poke us uh, that we need to look at to comply with. So that can be presented uh, next Monday. Okay, Trustee Duncan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Morris. I, I certainly appreciate that. Um, I, the, the other thing I think that certainly I wanted to sort of explore a little bit, if I, if I may, is around um, is around uh, amended. So uh, it, I guess contingency planning. So if I were to assume for a minute that the rest of the board was in support of um, using this five-year capital plan as an opportunity to change course, um, and appreciating that the timeline here um, and the need to submit the plan by the end of June. Um, I'm wondering whether um, we could get a little clarity on uh, worst case scenario, uh, we have to submit the plan and we don't have the costing uh, for heat pumps. Uh, I'm wondering when the next opportunity to amend or to provide an amended um, five-year capital plan with uh, the new, with the costings would be, I'm, I'm assuming that we can proactively at any point amend our five-year capital plan and send it off to the ministry. Um, but I'm wondering if uh, through the chair to staff, uh, th those timelines and requirements could be clarified. Um, before Mr. Morris answers, so I, I just wanna jump in here for a second. We got this report a month ago and I know that we had a speaker tonight who talks about this and has brought this to everybody's attention but I don't personally think it's fair to say to staff, we have this annually. If we wanna do a take direction and move it for next year's capital plans, CNCP, I can see moving in that direction. I can't see changing direction in the middle of a report that we've had a month at the last minute and changing it to move forward and expecting staff to be able to do all of that. So that, that's just my, having been working with the facilities for most of my years here and talking about the, the plans. It's a five-year capital plan. So I'll let Mr. Morris talk, but I just think it's a lot to ask of staff to change this in a week and then um, move forward. We might lose out on everything on this list if we don't provide with the costing and the, um, the projects that we have listed here. Mr. Morris? Uh, in response, uh, one week is uh, not enough time. So what we can do is uh, look at the upcoming years, uh, starting with our submissions for next year, uh, which we have to have in. Um, and wherever we can make any changes, we'll look at it. But right now, at this 11th hour, now is not the time to make a change because as the chair enunciated, um, we may not get some things if we hold it up. And my understanding is we only send in this once every year and there's no amendments throughout the year. Is that the case? I've never seen an amendment throughout the year. Okay, thank you. Usually the submissions, usually the submissions are well-researched and there's all kinds of information backing up the submission. And it take a thank lot you. of work to try to do an amendment. Thank you. Trustee Whitaker? Thank you. And thank you very much for this report and all of the learning that I'm doing this evening. Oh my goodness, there's so many new acronyms for me tonight. Um, and uh, also, you know, grouping the learning that we've, we've been doing with um, uh, previous presenters. So 
I'm not asking you to change all of this. My question is, is came up from, we submit this and when government, cause they're not gonna just pick everyone, they will pick one or two or whatever they, they are, are okay with funding. Are we at that time when they say, okay, this project, if for some reason we had further information when they say, you know, so uh, Reynolds is gonna get a replace existing boiler and they come up with the amount of money for that. If we were able to make a case for that and maybe add our own capital, would they still give us that money to do electric? Do you think? Uh, through the chair, yep. um, there's a lot uh, on their end, on the ministry yeah. end to give them credit. There are a lot of people and various departments right from our capital planning section all the way up to Treasury Board um, that spend an enormous amount of time going over these submissions. They have to make decisions based on 60 school districts. Yeah. And they've indicated in recent times that they're running out of money. They've actually suspended some projects for a couple of schools around the province. Um, no. Right. No, thank you for that. I mean, and, and I am aware that all of a sudden we are building a museum and capital funds have, have dried up. I just just wondered as technology sometimes changes. Um, and I mean, every time I turn on the news, I'm just shocked and amazed at what new technology is coming forward. So that's that's my question. Um, but thank you. Thank you. Trustee Duncan. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to Mr. Morris for, for clarifying what, what is reasonable and what is reasonably possible in terms of timelines and amendments and so on. Um, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, the idea that that uh, electrifying um, our heating and cooling is out of left field, I, I would take issue with that. Um, I, I think we, we just um, had a climate accountability report which outlines the need to electrify if we're going to meet our climate um, uh, targets and goals. So um, if it's not this capital plan, I, I, my expectation certainly is that we, um, we move forward in the ways we need to, whether it's through making changes to procurement or whether it's um, through board motion, um, you know, uh, committing to uh, in the future, putting forward plans that include um, electrification. Um, I, I'd be interesting to hear from through the chair uh, to the director of facilities um, if he has any advice or feedback for us in terms of how as a board um, we could meaningfully provide that leadership or that direction when it comes to um, moving in the direction of electrification um, as per our climate accountability uh, report. Mr. Morris. I may I ask Trustee Duncan just to repeat the uh, important portions of what you just said. Absolutely. Sorry, oh, sorry Chair. Well, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I'm wondering yeah, if no. you could, <laughs> I'm wondering if you have any advice for us as a board about how we might demonstrate some leadership uh, and give some direction, support the move to electric heating and cooling when we have an you know, opportunity. Uh, to replace end of life units. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what, from your perspective, how the board could support that change in direction. Uh, through the chair. Yep. Every time that staff make, um, uh, sorry, every time a staff research um, to improve what we have for infrastructure within all of our facilities, they do a lot of work. They speak to uh, whatever consultants we need to speak to long before a decision is made to support this or this or this. I would hope that the, the board would um, listen to the information that we present because it's founded on a lot of fact and compliance issues and the comfort and safety of the schools um, rather than just make a decision uh, without that input. Okay, Secretary Treasurer. Yeah, I just wanted to um, express my appreciation for the um, discussion tonight. I think it's uh, really vital to how we move forward 
I hope that uh, we can move this particular capital plan forward for approval and submission uh, this year. I know that uh, we have some planning principles that perhaps we could uh, explain further in a future uh, presentation. As well, we know we have our long range facilities plan uh, renewal coming up and I think the board and the community is going to play a big part in uh, what we want our future facilities to look like and what is our long range plan on that. And uh, I also uh, want to uh, reference the Climate Action Committee, where I believe a lot of this will lie as well in conjunction with future annual capital plans and our facilities planning. And so uh, the urgency is real. Uh, I think it is a bit uh, a bit of a short timeline for this particular capital plan, but uh, there are uh, plans and structures in place where we can start to make some um, intentional decisions about how to move this forward and the board will play a key part in that. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to approve the five-year capital plan. I'm going to call the question, all those in favor? And that's unanimous. Let's move forward. I'm going to call for a five minute break before we start on the policy stuff. Court of order, Chair. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> um, it wasn't unanimous. Um, I did Sorry. not vote in favor. Oh, are you voting opposed or abstaining? Um, I'm opposed. Great. Thank you very much for clarifying. Okay. Five minute break. Thank you. All those in favor? Okay. See you in five minutes.
Hey, I give folks one more minute and then we're gonna call everybody back. So we'll see who's listening. <laughs> Well, there's a couple yeah. listening. There you go. <laughs> I was listening. I'm always listening, Elaine. <laughs> I tell my mother-in-law the same thing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, we're getting there. It's going up one by one. There we go. that Tom and Jordan and Angie left. Oh, there's Jordan, Tom and Angie, I'm sure are on their way. So we, will, we shall start. Uh, thanks so much for a five minute break there. The pause that refreshes, I tell you. Um, we're at E3 on the agenda, uh, revised policy 3170 operating surplus and revised regulations. And uh, this is coming back to us. Um, and Secretary Treasurer, you've got a nice memo there. So I'll let you open it up. Sure. Uh, so we've been contemplating uh, this particular policy uh, since December uh, 2021 and prior to that even. Uh, this is a requirement uh, from the ministry per um, an order and their own policy around uh, more cons uh, consultation and intentionality around the use of surplus and the purposes for which surplus is being held. Uh, we put a draft uh, revision uh, on the webpage on January 5th and uh, as well it was sent out to our stakeholders. Uh, we also uh, worked through our Indigenous Education Department to place this item on a Four Houses agenda. Uh, we received one piece of feedback from the Urban People's House Indigenous Advisory uh, in that a suggestion to offer to uh, offer surplus opportunities first to the nations uh, address to address unmet needs and then to UFIA and uh, the Métis Nations. Um, the updated regulations been included in this surplus policy and uh, as well as the actual policy itself, as well as uh, the policy does have some revisions from our last discussion as a committee and uh, as a board. So we've gone out for public consultation. Uh, we've been working on this policy for quite some time. Uh, it does need to be uh, passed in order to meet our legislative requirements or to meet the ministry's policy. And so uh, we're hoping that the recommendation from the committee to the board can be to approve the um, operating surplus uh, policy 3170 as presented. Great, could I have somebody put the motion on the floor? Trustee Painter, thank you very much. Okay, so we're opening up the floor for discussion. So what I think I'm gonna go, do is go through this systematically again, as I've done in other policies, and we'll just deal with, uh, 1.0 rationale, if anybody has any questions or concerns about that portion of it. Seeing none, okay. Uh, we're now looking at 2.0, definitions. Any issues or concerns on definitions? Actually, sorry. I just wanted to go back actually to your 1.0. To pre, uh, the Board of Education to prepare a balanced annual budget. Are we not supposed to pass, not just prepare the annual budget? Uh, Secretary Treasurer? Yes, I think the preparation infers the approval, but uh, that is the legislation. So it's a, a matter of wording if that's what you like. Can to we change. just add prepare and pass just so new trustees don't? Like they get it. <laughs> Can we use the word approve rather than pass? Yeah, that's yep. fine with me. Yeah. That doesn't that doesn't change the intent, uh, Secretary Treasurer. So that was sort of a friendly amendment. Thank you. Okay, we're now in 2.0. We were on definitions and I didn't see anybody's hands under definitions. Okay, so we're moving to 3.0, the actual policy. And the three on page 38. The first three are struck and the new wording is at the top of page 39 for 3.1 and 3.2 and onward. Um, 
discussion. Any questions, concerns? Justy Whitaker. Yeah, I think you're going too fast for me because uh, I'm back in two and I don't know how we jumped to three. Well, I said under definitions, does anybody have any okay, questions? Well, so you do? Yeah, I do. You're just going okay. you're way too nope. quick for me this evening. I just went under <laughs> 2.8. Yep. Um, as disclosed on Schedule 2, will that always be Schedule 2? Um, Secretary Treasurer? Expenses will always be in Schedule 2, is that correct? It has been for the past decade or more. Okay. Just can somebody send me an example of a Schedule 2, too? Like, it doesn't have to be tonight or whatnot, but I just suddenly found myself going, oh, I don't have a visual of what that exactly is to know, because you keep saying Schedule 2 in here, and I'm... Anyway was wondering. Okay. Um, Anything else under section two? So I just also wondered why we lost 2.1. Sorry, I'm just making a note. Yes, thanks. Okay, Secretary Treasurer, 2.1, the significance of that? Coming um, out? Sorry? Uh, the old 2.1 being scrapped, that's what you're referring to, Trustee Whitaker? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think the uh, 2.1 is uh, restated several different ways throughout the rest of the twos. And the 2.0s or the definitions were pulled directly from the guidance document from the ministry. Okay. okay, so so for me, when I read that, at no point in these definitions, like they were definitions and they didn't, what I, what I read in 2.1 was the fact that these revenues could be used in the future for other expenditures. And when I read through the rest of 2.1, they're, they're definitions, right? They, it, there's nothing in there that says that really what these reserves are, are money that can be spent in the future. I mean, obviously we want to define how they're spent, but that they can be. So I might be the only one on that. I just wondered why that seemed to get lost in there unless it was coming up again in three. It's throughout three. Is it? Because that might be why I say, tell me more in 3.42. <laughs> okay. So any other questions under two, under definitions? Trustee Whitaker? No, I'm, I'm waiting to see that answered in three. Oh, okay. You're maybe, moving fast. Maybe, my, maybe now, my question comes through three. Okay. We're, we're, start, we're starting on three, the actual policy. So questions for number, on, under number, section number three. And that's a large section. So let's limit it to uh, up to 3.4. Well, yes. We'll, we'll end at 3.4 for these questions. We'll just break it down that way. Any questions for 3.1 through 3.4? Trustee Duncan. Yeah, just uh, what I think will be a minor uh, potential amendment at 3.3. Right now it says operating surplus appropriations or restrictions will be made by board motion. Um, I would like to replace the word will with must. It's a requirement, and I would like to stress that by changing the wording, if we could, just from will to must. Secretary Treasurer, it doesn't change the intent of anything, does it? No. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Then, anybody else under three, one through three, four? Okay, seeing none, we're moving three, five through three, eight. Oh, I'm any sorry. Questions? I thought you were coming back to 3.4. I just said any uh, concerns sorry. up to 3.4. Trustee Whitaker. Okay. So 3.42. Yep. Restricted for anticipated unusual expenses. And you do give me an example here of staffing, but maybe can you just sort of describe this to me a little bit more? I, I didn't quite, I couldn't come up with a time when we had ever done this. So I struggled to understand where we would restrict for an upcoming unusual expense. Secretary I, Treasurer? 
I think the past two uh, budget rounds have been uh, a great example of unusual expenses. And so where we're trying not to reduce uh, services or make major changes because of a blip, uh, then um, a surplus could be used uh, in terms of uh, not making drastic cuts to services, but by using uh, surplus to balance. And I think the board uh, uh, took great liberty or took great uh, leadership in terms of uh, trying to take some risk uh, to use surplus to mitigate the uh, cuts that may have been required through budget in terms of um, identifying and using unrestricted surplus. Oh, I, I'm sorry, because it said one time and intermittent projects not ongoing. So that's, I guess, my confusion. Like when would we plan in advance for a one-off a one -off project? Uh, so a uh, student device replacement or um, a literacy program, if it was finite in time. I think what we're trying to get across here is if you have a consistent shortfall in your um, revenues that you shouldn't continue to use surplus for a decade to balance your budget. But if you are in a situation where your revenues are decreased for a certain time and you uh, may only need uh, to use surplus for a year or two, and then you're back to where your revenues match your expenses in order to not um, make huge uh, cuts to services uh, would be where uh, this 3.4.2 would come in. Okay. Okay. The wording just, uh, just challenged me, I think, a little bit because it seems it, now that you've explained it, that seems to answer my question on three, two. So it was just a little wordy, maybe. Okay. So 3.1, 3.2, 3 3.3, and 3.4. Any more questions on that section? Okay. Seeing none, we're moving to 3.5 through 3.8. Any questions in that section, Trustee Duncan? Yeah, and so please just bear with me. I'm moving through a couple of different documents, clicking through screens, so um, bear with me a second. Okay, so I gotta go back to the agenda pack up here briefly. Okay, so at uh, 3.6, um, I just wanted to clarify. So this one right now, it says the board may restrict operating surplus for future capital cost share to support major capital projects that are identified in the board's five-year capital plan and approved uh, by the ministry for concept plan or business case development where no lo local um, or restricted capital reserves are available. Um, ha having kind of read through the ministry's um, uh, K to 12 uh, public education surplus uh, policy companion documents, um, which I highly recommend my colleagues read. It's only 11 pages and it really nicely outlines the intention behind the policy. Um, it's, it says, that, you know, it's very similarly worded to 3.6 in our policy, but there is, I think, a very key uh, uh, part that is missing from ours that I would suggest we add. So um, after uh, cost share, uh, sorry, Boards may restrict operating surplus to satisfy capital project cost share expectations at the time the project is brought forward for funding approval. Capital cost share expectations, um, sorry, for just at the time the project can be brought, um, is brought forward for funding approval. Um, I think it, in terms of, uh, it, it places a timeline and a limitation so that boards are not sort of stockpiling operating funds for years on end to um, cover uh, potential cost share years down the line. Um, I think that's exactly, you know, I think that the whole point is to avoid that. And so by putting that timeline which um, in, which is taken directly from the companion document to the policy, um, I think that would address um, my potential concern with that. Secretary Treasurer. I'm sorry, are you referring to 3.6? Then I yes. do not yes. know what is proposed to be changed, sorry. And neither do um, I. So you're, yeah, gonna have so, to, you're gonna have to read yeah. the whole old sentence with your new amendments, because I didn't get it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So no problem. So um, after, um, or business case development, sorry, now let me go back again.
So the first part of the sentence stays the same in your yep. app or business case That's development. Right. Yeah, okay. it's all fine. Yeah. And then after or business case um, developments, it would read um, at the time the project is brought forward for funding approval. By the ministry? Uh, no, the by, the, by the board. Yeah, by the board. Mm. Nice. So I this is what three point six is related to when the ministry is um, advanced the project. So you're right. So we're not stockpiling. Yeah. So and again, so this let me give you a little bit of you know my thoughts, and you can correct me, Secretary Treasurer. So in the companion document to the policy, um, what in terms of restricted uh, for future capital cost share, what it says is to support major capital projects that are identified in the board's five-year capital plans, like in our draft at 3.6, and approved by the ministry for concept, plan, or business case developments. Again, that's already reflected at 3.6. And then it continues, it says, boards may restrict operating surplus to satisfy capital project cost share expectations at the time the project is bought, brought forward for funding approval. So, to me, that that key piece is um, that there is uh, some recognition that you know you would consider restricting uh, operating surplus to satisfy a project cost share at the time the project's being brought forward for funding approval, um, and 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 not kind of you know held for years on end. Um, so I, I, again, I'm happy to take your direction. I just yeah. noticed there was a difference, and I and I wondered whether there should. Be I don't. I don't disagree. Uh, brought forward for funding approval. I guess what we would want to do is uh, fully understand. Uh, funding approval by the board would happen when the funding agreement comes after the project had been approved, and so that might be too late for the board to have saved up money. I think. Um, uh, so I wouldn't want to restrict us to that. Uh, I think the wording here is flexible enough to allow um, us to be able to set aside surplus when the ministry has uh, moved a project from that application stage in the five-year capital plan to a concept plan or business case. Um, if we say uh, forward for funding approval by the board, I fear that's too late. Uh, we know that uh, we have to agree to put forward, or we have agreed in the past to put forward capital contributions uh, long before a funding agreement comes forward. So I guess it's just a nuance there, Trustee Duncan, that I uh, am cautious about. Yeah, I'm sorry, I should clarify. Um, I'm not I'm not suggesting that we add anything that is not intended by the ministry policy. So if at the time the project is bought, brought forward for funding approval, uh, the intention is to for that to be when the ministry approves. Um, that's fine. Um, I, I'm just I'm just saying I, I think we should have a clarifying piece about about sort of the timeline and so that we were you know flexibility is good. But I also want to honor the intention of the ministry policy document, and I believe it is to you know ensure that boards don't stockpile money for a long time in order to satisfy some kind of future uh, cost sharing arrangement. So however you think we should do that, <laughs> I'm happy I, to accept, but um, yeah. I think 3.6 addresses it in terms of um, you can't appropriate that money until uh, a board or the ministry has identified a project that may advance. So I, I feel like there's enough protection there and enough alignment with the uh, companion guide. Uh, I just wouldn't want to yeah, restrict us unnecessarily. Okay, thank you very much. Anything else under 3.5, 3.6, 3.7 or 3.8, Trustee Duncan? Yeah, and um, thank you to Secretary Treasurer for clarifying 3.6 for me. Um, 3.7 was the other um, piece. I just, again, um, it 3.7 indicates that the, the span of three years or more. Um, my understanding is that 
we should be looking at two years. Um, but again, I wanted to clarify my understanding because maybe I'm reading it wrong. I thought we would want to uh, not restrict um, monies uh, for any longer than a kind of two years. Um, maybe we'll get yeah. Secretary of Treasurer to expand on that. Sure, I think we can change that to two years. I do believe uh, within the companion guide, there is a, a two-year reference and a three-year reference. Uh, I think a two-year is uh, suitable in 3.7 if we want to make that change. Okay, all those in favor of going to two years, say aye. Okay, so we're changing that one to two years. Okay, anything else, Trustee Duncan, in that section? Does it cover 3.8, uh, Chair? Are we looking at 3.8 yet or no? Yeah, we have been 3.5 to 3.8, so With you're 3 .8? Okay, yep. great. Um, I just wanted to discuss 3.8 briefly. Um, we mentioned the, the unrestricted operating surplus will be maintained um, at between two uh, and 4% of the previous year's operating um, revenue. I'm wondering um, if we can, uh, I look at some more flexible language. I mean, I, I guess my concern is that I, I know that we've got a ministry, um, I believe it's a ministerial order. Is that right? Uh, through the chair to the secretary treasurer? It's a ministry policy. A policy. Um, so um, I, I'm wondering if uh, we can use some language uh, that gives, a, gives us a little more flexibility in building that reserve. So I know we talked about during the budget process that, um, you know, the, the various range of two to four and what trustees were thinking in terms of what uh, was reasonable and, and tenable, but um, there will be maintained um, part, <laughs> um, you know, in light of our current uh shortfalls, let's just say, and, and budget constraints. I'm wondering if we can look at some more flexible language and still adhere to that ministry policy directive. So Secretary Treasurer, I thought that's the range that they gave us in their policy. Was it that not? Is, that is the range provided. Um, I'm not so, sure. I know that uh, we, through the budget process, proposed some staggered uh, approach to 2%. We're sitting with 1% right now. Uh, which is uh, untouched in the budget, which is great. Um, uh, but to move to two, we had proposed doing that over uh, two or three years. And uh, so that remains to be seen if we fully recover from COVID and our international enrollment, et cetera. And now inflationary pressures and escalation costs. Uh, I think as we move toward at least 2%, um, you know, we're not there now. Uh, and, and I don't think the ministry is going to force us to cut another million dollars of or $2 million of services in order to meet 2%. But I think it is an intent in the policy. Um, and I don't know if there's any uh, sort of flexibility words we can insert there. Um, I think it is something that we should be striving for at least 2%. So I'm not sure what you had in mind, Trustee Duncan. Yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was more direction that we were to get there and, and be having the range in there shows the minimum. Which yeah, is what, was more we, what we were about, striving for. Yeah, I was more concerned about the will. So the part that the, the, the will be maintained. I mean, I, I think there's no question that we're gonna work towards that. Um, but I, I wanted to just acknowledge, I suppose that, you know, yes, we've got this ministry policy and we intend to work towards achieving that, but, I didn't want to bind us in, in because the reality is it's going to take a number of years to realistically even get to 2%. Um, and so, yeah, I honestly didn't have a solution on this one, uh, mainly just a concern. I was hoping that some of my colleagues or possibly staff would have a bright idea. I, and it, maybe it's not an issue. Maybe I'm worrying about nothing. Uh, maybe the wording isn't an issue and really the ministry isn't going to be saying to us, look, you know, you need to get that to at least a 2% reserve and we don't care how you do it, uh, <laughs> but get it done. Uh, you're, you know, in breach of the policy. Um, so yeah, be interested to hear from colleagues if they have any ideas. Trustee Whitaker. Thank you. I actually pointed this out. And for me, I actually heard Kim use the word. I had uh, edited this to say that the board will strive 
to maintain restricted uh, operating surplus between two and 4%, uh, specifically because I didn't wanna write a policy right now that we aren't in compliance with. And I really don't think it's fair to bind the next board to have to achieve a 2% when we ourselves didn't achieve that 2%. So I thought that, yeah, we do want to get there, but it's not realistic to, I mean, one, to, to, to bind this next board to that, that it is going to be a gradual thing and we're not going to reach it. I mean, maybe we do reach it next year, but we're going to have a lot of new enrollment if that's, if we're going to, and I, we can't confirm that. So I think it's important that we do keep the amount as something that we want to strive for. Um, but we also don't want to put the board out of compliance with its own uh, policies right away. Uh, so Trustee Painter, is that an amendment? Do I need to make that as an amendment so that? Uh, well, so I want I want the Secretary Treasurer to speak to it, but I'll let Trustee Painter speak first, and then we'll go back to. Um, well, Secretary I would still Treasurer. like to make that amendment if somebody wants to second it, because often I don't get to get back to that. So, can I put that amendment on the floor? Uh, can I ask the Secretary Treasurer to comment on what the ministerial policy says exactly? Striving might not meet the ministerial mandate. That's that's what I'm concerned about. So, Secretary Treasurer, if you could comment, would the word "strive" accomplish what it the ministerial policy is directing boards to do? I think it does want us to maintain between uh, certain bookends, but I understand the pressure to get there and the uh, out of compliance piece. Uh, the alternative is the board could pass the um, the uh, policy the way it is now with the bookends, which I think are fairly important. Um, and uh, from time to time or during budget or uh, financial uh, surplus allocations, it could vary its policy and say, we, you know, we're varying 3.8 of policy um, uh, whatever it is, sorry, I don't know the number off the top of my head, I'm on 3.8, uh, varying the policy until we can get to the 2% in this particular surplus allocation or this particular budget. Was there a timeline the ministry directs boards to get there by? Uh, this policy was supposed to be in place December 31st, 2021. Okay, okay. Uh, so um, Ryan, and then I'll go back to Anne. So uh, a couple things um, on the language and the expectation. Uh, and Kim, feel free to, to jump in here if, if I've misinterpreted um, what took place at Academy. So I, I think it was at Academy when the ministry was uh, bringing forward um, a, a session on, on this policy to discuss and let trustees know what was coming down the pipe and I think my interpretation was that they understood many boards uh, or a lot of boards weren't there yet um, and that there was an understanding uh, from the ministry that while boards uh, weren't there yet there's every expectation that they get there that they have a plan to get there as fast as possible Kim am I on track there or have I have I misstated something uh, I was not at that session, uh, and oh, I okay. didn't attend uh, Academy. I'm sorry, trustee. Oh, people. sorry. I feel like that's I, okay. Feel like, <laughs> no, okay. Anyways, that's my my interpretation, and I did ask uh, ministry staff similar questions around timeliness and expectation, and it was relatively, from my experience, ambiguous. So uh, I have no challenge being very specific and direct with us. And furthermore, I have no challenge binding the next board um, with this uh, because I think we need to be, uh, we need to be specific on the expectation that we need to, we need to meet the, the anticipations of this policy. And I actually think it would be, um, uh, I'll say it, I think it will be irresponsible to, to not be as direct and specific in our language with a policy uh, as we can to ensure that the future board is able to, um, to look back and say, this is what previous boards desired for us to get to, we need to get to this. Um, so for me, I want to keep the language that's here. Um, it's good language, it's direct, it's specific, it's unambiguous. And I think that's exactly what this policy is trying to get to. 
and also for the budget, the three-year budget process that we set out when we passed the budget in April, it seems so long ago now, there was a three-year plan to get to 2%. Um, so that would be left for the next board too, that there was a plan in place. Trustee Whitaker, are you wanting to put forward an amendment? Yeah, just like I said, I'd like to put forward an amendment. Okay. And it will say uh, that the board will strive to maintain an unrestricted operative surplus between two and 4% and will achieve this by 2025. That's right, isn't that the number of years out? Which actually says everything that you guys are talking about. I just really think it's important that the next board is not thinking that they have to be at 2% and not in compliance and that will put us at 2% by 2025. Sorry, Chair. A quick point of point yeah. of uh, not really a point of order. Just uh, mm -hmm. uh, just about Trustee Whitaker's motion. Are we striking everything here and putting your motion in instead? Sorry, I'm unclear. So you're asking clarification of Trustee Whitaker. I'm not sure. That's right. Yeah. yeah so I'm asking Trustee Whitaker in 3.8. Are we striking this whole motion and putting in your wording, or this whole the policy last piece? Sentence. Sorry. The last sentence that says the unrestricted operating surplus currently is the sentence okay. we will change. Okay. okay. And can you read your sentence one more time? That the Board of Education will strive to maintain an unrestricted operating surplus maintain, or maintain between two and 4% and will or will strive for that and will achieve this by 2025. What okay. are we in 2022? So, yeah, so, that's right. We have an amendment to the 3.8, a uh, discussion on the amendment. Trustee Painter and then Trustee Duncan. So, I mean, I think I made it pretty clear I, I won't support uh, the amendment. Uh, I don't think it's specific enough. Um, and I actually think the amendment is in conflict with the very first line of 3.8, which says the board will maintain. Um, so the very first line that says the board will maintain a reasonable unrestricted operating surplus and then the last line saying the board will strive to maintain. We now have two lines, in my opinion, that are in conflict. Uh, regardless, I don't support weakening the language of this, this, uh, this piece. So I will not support the amendment. Trustee Duncan speaking to the amendment. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I like the additional sentence. It addresses my concern, which was that there was a... Um, a lack of any kind of meaningful description of the sort of transition period that we're in um, and how we plan to get there. And so I, I think it's actually helpful um, and I will support it. Thank you. Okay, um, I put my name on the speaker's list. I will, I will not be supporting the amendment. I think the language that's in the um, current um, policy 3.8 is what the, a new board will need to move forward. They will have that in place and they will have the budget, a three-year budget uh, information in place that uh, we approved in April. So I think they have um, enough information to move forward and enough plan to move forward to get there. So I will not be supporting the amendment. Any other discussions on the amendment? Okay, seeing that I'll call the question on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment? It's Trustee Whitaker and Trustee Duncan. Those opposed to the amendment? Thank you, Chief. All, all other trustees were opposed. So we're back to the original wording of the document. Uh, any other questions or concerns from 3.5, 3.6, 3.7, or 3.8? Okay, seeing none, we're moving on to, up to four. 4.1 one and 4.2, any concerns there? Trustee Duncan and then Whitaker. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so again, I'm turning to staff and I'd appreciate some uh, guidance. Am I supposed to the chair, particularly to the secretary treasurer? Um, I know that the, the boards as part of the policy boards are required to provide the ministry with a, an annual report on our budget allocations or in particular our surplus budget allocation decisions. Um, and I know that there are uh, a number of templates uh, that the ministry has provided uh, school districts, um, which we can use or adapt um, uh, and, and develop our own. 
I wonder if, I mean, what I'd like to see, I suppose it's not here yet, is an acknowledgement of that reporting requirement and a link to the kind of regular um, annual uh, budget related reporting that, that we do. Um, so I guess maybe um, I'm looking for a suggestion on, on, on where in the policy we could acknowledge that requirement. Um, and uh, specify that it will be something that the board considers on an annual basis as part of its its annual budgeting process. Secretary Treasurer. Yeah, I think we could insert something into the regulation. Uh, I think the policy indicates that we'll comply with the, um, sorry, uh, this policy and then in the regs we could um, identify the reporting. Great. And Trustee Whitaker, did you have your hand up? Yep. Oops. Yeah, I did. I just wondered where the response under the responsibilities where, you know, we have we have to create the budget, uh, but specifically the Board of Education must follow public sector accounting standards. I see that is lost. I do see you have it in references, but I think it's an important piece that is included. What what rules were you know, what rules we use in our accounting reporting and, and what we have to follow. So I kind of thought that should not be lost and inserted. Secretary Treasurer. Uh, where was it inserted in the old policy? It's at 4.3 in the old policy and it's been struck. Okay, I can add that back if you like. And I just want to confirm that is the one that we follow, right? Yeah. That didn't change. Okay, yeah, I just think that should still be in there. And that was uh, Trustee Whitaker, if you can rephrase that again, please. What would you like me to rephrase? What you're adding in there again. I want 4.3. Instead of old... struck, it would be unstruck. Okay. I must not have that in front of me, but that, oh, I see up there, public sector, yeah. got it. Oh, 4.3 added, okay. Okay, any other concerns under 4.1 or 4.2? Okay, so starting at the beginning, I'll tell you what I have for changes, and then we're gonna call the question. Um, I have uh, at the top of 1.0, the School Act requires the Board of Education to prepare and approve a balanced annual budget. Uh, nothing else on the first page. On the second page, um, I have nothing on the second page. On the third page, 3.3, uh, the word will must be changed, it will be changed to must. Uh, the fourth page, 3.7, three years is being changed to two years. And 4.3 has been added on the last page, the old 4.3. Did I miss anything from anybody? Okay, call the question. All those in favor of this policy. Okay, are those opposed? Abstentions? Trustee Duncan and Whitaker, I don't have your, your recorded vote. I'm so four. It's, it's in four in favor. Yeah, I am. Yeah. Thank you, Trustee Whitaker. I, yeah, I'll just I don't vote know how to it at the board. Pardon? I don't. So, it, yeah, fine, I will pass it here. I'm just going to do my final vote at the board. And we're just going to rerun it. Then. That's fine. So that was uh, unanimous. So thank you very much. Moving on to uh, revised policy 8210, orienting orienting new board members. Um, Secretary Treasurer, did you want to open this one or not? Uh, no, I think it's fairly evident. It's a policy we reviewed uh, given that it's an election year and uh, are bringing it forward for discussion tonight. Okay, would somebody like to put the motion on the floor? Trustee Painter, thank you very much. Um, well, again, we'll work through it uh, slowly. Methodically. Just a point of order. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I just wanted to clarify where we were in the packup. So 
I don't believe we discussed the regulation um, yet. It was the intention not to discuss the regulation or? The regulation is for information for, for board members. We don't, we don't usually uh, debate uh, regulations. So uh, if the only thing that we were adding was we were identifying a reporting process in there. Secretary Treasurer said that she would add something in the regulations, but the regulations are a fluid document and uh, maybe I can let Secretary Treasurer speak to that, but they don't come forward for board approval. They come forward for information. Well, sorry, Chair, just to clarify, um, so the administrative regulations need to comply with the policy and to the extent that the administrative regulations speak to items that are not included in the policy, then I, then I would uh, suggest that the board does in fact have a role to play. But uh, the other point I would make around that is that um, when we've got a new policy like this, which is completely new, um, the, the idea that the board would not engage in discussions at committee level about a complementary administrative regulation I see as extremely problematic and not in line uh, with our bylaw on the on the formulation and development of policy and um, our bylaw on administrative regulations. So, um, you know, I'm happy to raise my concerns um, at, at the board meeting, but I'd, I would rather engage in the discussion at standing committee. But uh, again, I'm at the will of the majority of this board. Okay, I... Unless I hear differently, I'm moving on to 8210 for orientation. Trustee Whitaker? I just wanted to make the comment that as much as the board doesn't have to approve, uh, as was presented by the interim superintendent previously, the board does get to review and provide input into regulations, as was done uh, when the superintendent presented it, and we changed the language in the dress code policy. Um, so I just wanted to make that point of clarification that uh, I think that the chair is wrong in this case, that there is opportunity for. Okay. Um, so my suggestion is that it come, the regulations come forward to another ops meeting. We do have a full ops agenda tonight and we've spent an awful lot of time on the first policy already. We do have three other policies to try and move through. So if uh, people want to bring the, ask that the regulation be brought to the next ops meeting, um, I think that would be perfectly understandable if we don't have a, such a large agenda. Well, I don't understand why it was in this agenda if we're not going to discuss it attached to. But of course, the majority of this board will rule. Secretary Treasurer, is it something we need to... Um, the regulation is attached. The regulation is attached here tonight for information. Okay, thank you. Um, policy eighty two ten. We have this one before us. There are a updates, a few changes. Uh, mostly, it's bringing it up to what we what we um, need to have in place for a new board coming into. Uh, to being next, next October. So we'll go through it slowly and methodically, um, starting with the rationale 1.0. Any concerns or questions with 1.0? Okay, uh, 2.0 has nothing, so we'll move on. Uh, 3.0 policy, and that's the bulk of what we're in. So right now we'll do- Can you go a little bit slower? You okay. see, you rush along. So 1.1, <laughs> When it says yep. incumbent trustees and the superintendent shall assist newly elected trustee, the, I think should be trustees, to understand the board's functions, policies, and procedures before said trustee takes office. I wonder why um, other, you know, seasoned trustees, anyway, I guess what you are trying to say is that all trustees will do this, but I'm how will that happen, right? I'm, I'm worried when you say that some trustees and the superintendent, like how does that work? Is there a vision or a plan that goes with that? Well, uh, have you, were you ever phoned by a new trustee for guidance after you'd been on the board for a term or two? I know I have been. So I guess it just happens that that's what I would be talking about or incumbent trustees, um, 
taking the lead at a session or things like that. I don't think it's it's planned out who is doing it. It just it just happens. And I appreciate that. And I would like more of that. I just I know that in the past that that was not encouraged that trustees were told to go to the chair. So I just want to clarify that this is all trustees and it's not the chair or the vice chair, right? It's all incumbent trustees. That's the way it's worded. Okay. Okay. Okay, moving on to 3.0. So we'll look at 3.1 to 3.5. That's on page 44. 3.1 to 3.5. Any questions, concerns, or issues there? Trustee Whitaker. Okay, so it says following the filing of nomination papers and during the period of their candidacy, so uh, that the superintendent will cooperate. But what about somebody, I mean, right now, somebody might be interested in running, but they don't actually fill their nomination papers. So can it be when they express interest in their candidacy? I don't want it to be that they have to wait until September to actually file their papers before anybody's going to help them or give them that information. Does that make sense? Am I being too picky? Well, I know that there's two sessions set up currently and that which yeah, is the pre it's before the pre-filing period and so uh i i think what this is encouraging and secretary treasurer can can uh update me if i'm wrong it's it's stopping 25 people from coming into the sick to the superintendent's office and asking for all of the information about the organization once the people have filed their papers and during that time, they're a little bit more committed than it just is at this time of the season, which is why you have the two pre-meetings. Um, maybe Secretary Treasurer or the Superintendent can, can speak to that, but that would be why I would think that was there. Yeah, for me, I think the intention of uh, following the nomination papers is uh, that the person has uh, provided some commitment. Otherwise we could have uh, many, many people um, contacting staff to try to get information, um, which is great, but sometimes that can be a, a, a lot of time taken up. And I think we just need to remind ourselves of the title of the policy and it's orienting new board members. And so filing a nomination paper and then uh, getting some assistance from the superintendent would indicate that uh, there's a clear intent uh, to become a new board member, member and to begin that orientation. I would suggest if you wanted to include uh, some of the pre-candidacy uh, sessions, such as the one running on Thursday, we may want to um, bolster or change our elections uh, policy if we have one, uh, which I think we do. Uh, and you may want to add something uh, in that policy around offering some sessions for uh, prospective candidates. Thank you. Okay, anybody else under 3.0, 3.1 to 3.5? Trustee Whitaker? Okay, so 3.4 says the policy and regulation development process. So which process are we going to train them on? Can we quote some of the policies? put some numbers in there, whatnot. I just know that we haven't done a very good job of following our own policies and our development of uh, bylaws, et cetera, that I wanna make sure that we are doing that correctly, just to say that we're going to um, let them know about policy and regulation development. Is there going to be a plan following our own policies or just past practice? Well, that would be part of the orientation where we discuss the policy and how the development process moves forward. I don't think you would quote individual policies in here, but I, I'm open to whatever it is. But I, this is this is more general on what you're going to orient the new board on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else under three point one to three point five? Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to turn the page. Uh, 3.6 to 3.12. Any concerns there? Okay, anything under 4.0? Yeah. 
Trustee Duncan? Yeah, I'm wondering whether I'm just quickly going back to, to the end of 3.0. Um, is it, you know, I mean, I've got my own views, um, having been a new trustee in the last four years, um, about what, uh, how we could orient new board members. Um, and so I'm wondering if this is meant to be an exhaustive list or a list, a thorough list of all the things that you would, that we as a board would want to provide new board members in, in order to orient them to the role of being a trustee. Um, and if so, then, um, then yes, I have a, a number of things I think that, that I would suggest we add. Um, well, so, Three, for instance, 3.12 says other areas as required or requested. So, of course, yeah, that, that, everything would, could fall under that. that. But if, if you had specific things that you wanted to add, uh, now would be the time to bring them up if yeah. that's what you wanted to do. Yeah, I, well, I suppose I should, shouldn't I? Um, so, yep. um, well, so, from in my own experience, um, it, it proves surprisingly difficult to get, a, you know, just a hold of board bylaws, policies and regulations, ministerial orders, um, and, and so on. So um, I would suggest that we add um, a, a number, uh, say, I don't know, uh, in play or above 3.12 uh, 3 maybe, um, to, you know, with a list of sort of like the foundational documents that if you're going to be a school board trustee, you need uh, to review in order to come to the table informed. So um, that list would include board bylaws, policies, regulations, ministerial orders, a copy of the School Act and regulations, Robert's Rules of Order, the latest board budget, uh, board committee structure in terms of reference, um, outstanding board motions and letters of advocacy sent on behalf of the previous board. Um, so yeah, I, I would suggest that we that we add those things um, as a commitment to um, providing new trustees with those foundational. Uh, do you do you, do you see some of those things under references as opposed to being included? Like references would be the school act, uh, board, school district bylaws, policies, and regs. I see some of those under references as opposed to being um, uh, added up in the above area, but that's I just think, me. I think that um, they are, some of them are both references, but really my intention is to sort of set the tone early on with new trustees um, and be proactive and make a commitment to providing these documents uh, proactively. Um, in my experience, um, you know, people come to the table with differing levels of, of, of knowledge, experience, and, you know, may not even think to ask, um, may not know that, that the, these documents are foundational and that they need to have a familiarity with them. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, I suppose what I'm looking for is a commitment to be proactive in providing all new board members as a matter of course, as they're oriented, these foundational uh, documents. Okay, any other questions about that area? Um, so the so the list uh, that you had is um, not. Let's see, you had bylaws, policy, regulations, ministerial or orders, school act, and then what was the rest of them? Yeah, so school act and and the regulations. Uh, a copy of Robert's Rules of Order, the the latest board budget, uh, uh, board committee structure in terms of reference, and then uh, these are sort of similar um, outstanding a list of outstanding board motions and letters of ad advocacy sent on behalf of the board during the previous term. And again, the intention there, um, from my perspective, is to give new trustees a, a grounding and in uh, the, the work of the previous board and, and areas where they might want to, they might need to or want to pick up and uh, carry some of that work forward. Okay, Secretary Treasurer, do you see any issues with adding that under, uh, I don't know, pick a number, three point. Some of them I think fall under some of the other 
like the budget process. I would assume that you would get a copy of the budget at the budget process, but um, yeah. Secretary I, Treasurer? I think that uh, adding to the list is fine uh, as indicated. Um, yeah, uh, I hope these could be provided in a digital form rather than a, a hard copy would be my only concern. Yeah. So do you see some of them being under references or do you see them all as, an, as a listing? Uh, I feel like I understand what Trustee Duncan is trying to do and I do think it would fall under three. Okay, but would they all be a separate number under three, I guess is my question, because all of these things are meeting are very individual in their listing. So are you doing like 312, 313, 314? I down think to foundational, like I think uh, one line item with foundational documents and a small list may uh, assist. Okay, 313 foundational documents. Trustee Duncan, how does that sound? That sounds great, thank you. Okay, so we'll have that on the document added for the end of the month. And then we can talk about that there. And that was uh, three, anything under four? Okay, so I don't think we have this on the floor yet. It's, or Trustee, did somebody put this on the floor? Have we already done that? Trustee Waters, thank you. Okay, so under changes, I have an S added to trustees under number one. I have nothing on that page three. Um, and I have uh, 313, which will be foundational documents and the listing there. And that was the only changes I had recorded. Did I miss anything? Okay, call the question. All those in favor of the revised document? And that was unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Those are the two revised documents. Number E5, new policy, role of the trustee. Uh, we don't have a number for it. That is to be pending, but this is a new, a new um, document uh, that we've brought forward to the policy committee um, to, again, accompany the suite of other uh, trustee-related documents that were going to be in place for a new board in October. So um, we're gonna start again at 1.0. Any issues with 1.0? Questions, concerns? Okay, 2.0, there's no definitions there. We're doing 3.0, 3.1 to 3.4. Questions, concerns? Trustee Duncan? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, I'm wondering, as I read, so at 3.1, the, the last uh, few words um, of the last sentence, it says, a trustee must first and foremost be concerned with the interests of the school board and its stated mission. Um, I, and again, this might not be an issue for others. Um, I'm just concerned with some of the language. Um, I, I really want us to be very kind of intentional with, um, you know, ensuring we have a common understanding to the extent that it's possible when we say things like the interests of the school board. So, um, you know, um, the interests of the school board, you know, for instance, um, uh, or the school district or students, um, you know, may not do you, have be... do you have suggested wording that would change? Maybe that'd be easier question. Do you have something that you would like to propose that's different? I think for me, and, and, and I'll think about it between now and, and the board meeting, um, because I anticipate that this will go through to the board. Um, I, you know, I think for me, it, it's really about the, the, the tone, um, of the document, and I'm not sure kind of how to to kind of change it um, to address the tone, but um, I, I will think about it, and I will come forward with uh, okay some amendments. But tonight, um, reviewing it tonight um, at this at this particular time, right now, I just have some concerns, and 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 part of it's related to 
Um, also this idea of, you know, the, the balancing the, the obligation to be a member of a corporate board and an elected official. Uh, and, I, and I think that the, the, the current draft seems to me anyways, to suggest that the, the, the paramount role as a school board governor um, is to, uh, is, is to the, the corporate board. And um, I think, you know, it, as, a, as, as trustees, we really need to unpack what we mean when we say corporate board, you know, what rights and responsibilities a corporate board has under law, um, and, and really what the balance is uh, as it relates to our elected um, capacity as, as one amongst nine. Uh, and I just don't think that this document addresses that. And, and I think it's, you know, that issue uh, is coming up provincially more and more. And, I, and, I, and it's not just our board that I think it struggles with that, but I think it's an issue uh, that requires, in my view, uh, some time and attention to, to really uh, unpack that. Because I think um, from what I've seen anyways, uh, it can lead to a great deal of conflict and uh, potentially to the expenditure of uh, quite a lot of public money. So um, I thank you, Chair, for uh, indulging me. I will come back uh, and see what I can do to, to make some changes so that I you know, think the document is fit for purpose um, by the board meeting. I'm not gonna belabor the point that you just made, but 3.2 talks about all of those things that you just talked about, about balancing our, our role within the community and the the governance, um, so that's just, that seems to have covered under 3.2. Does you, did it, um, anybody else have any comments under 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, or 3.4? Trustee Whitaker? Yeah, I actually, it's interesting that Trustee Duncan made those comments, because for me, I was also starting to strike out some of these pieces and around fiduciary duty, right? When I look at 3.4, um, a trustee must serve the community as elected representative, but the trustee's primary task is to ask, act as a member of the corporate board. So just finding a lot of conflicts and especially in the tone. And when we go further down in 3.4, a trustee's fiduciary duties are owed to the school board, which is in turn accountable to the electorate. So I find that confusing um where my duty lies in there so uh, anyway i think those are interesting i look forward to trustee duncan's thoughts on that but i also noted that mari has her hand up as well well thank you mari oh yes hello thank you so much uh for this so opportunity we're, dis we're discussing uh, yeah. 3.1 to 3.4 right now are you talking yeah. about those ones Yes, actually, I uh, sent a question to, I mean, I got the email when I joined the Zoom. And I, it said I have to send a question to the chat. So I did send a question to the chat. But I, I just wonder, like 3.2, it says like uh, trustees balance their governance role with their representative role. It's so kind of the same thing that I think trustees Whitaker and Duncan were saying, but it just, just seemed like a, the, the, are these supposed to be against each other or like, a, I mean, I felt like th these are supposed to be the same thing that trustees are supposed to be like serving the community as a elected representative. And that is their, uh, but is this supposed to like conflict with the other roles or like, I mean, this is just what I, I don't understand actually. That's, that's my question. <laughs> Sorry. So, so, so trustees listen to the community, trustees hear the community, but trustees are responsible for balancing the needs of the entire district at the same time. So yes, it sounds like a conflict, but when we come in and make a decision, we have to think about the entire district as a whole when we're making those decisions. Even though we've had input from the community and we've had input from specific groups, we have to balance that with what is in the best interest of the district. So that's what this is speaking to and, and that's what the board's responsibility is. So so your understanding is that um, maybe the community does not uh, want student best, uh, like a, to put prioritize students always, or like because board 
has to prioritize student first, right? But like, you know, I'm a community. I also prioritize student. So I don't know how we can be like a different opinion, like diff like we, we would have, like we are, we would be working together, not like against, right? No, I understand. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna debate you because obviously um, you're not understanding what I just said. So I'm not gonna debate that with you. So, okay. um, so, so it's not, it's not appropriate to do that right now. So yeah, I, yeah. Thank I just you, don't I, understand. I think, I'm not even, no, no, yeah. I thank you for your input. And, um, but, but I think the way this 3.2 is worded does reflect yeah. our responsibility. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions on 3.1 to 3.4? Okay. Trustee Whitaker. No, I, I guess, you know, especially just hearing from Mari, I think the, the point to be heard here is that I understand that the conflict and the, and the, the friction there it's just that the language or the way this is written is it just needs, it needs a bit of work because it obviously is a bit confusing. Okay, we're on 3.5, and that's uh, a larger piece here. So 3.5 on page 47. Any questions or concerns in 3.5? Trustee Whitaker? So just because it came up in this previous term at 3.53 about arranging contact with principals and visiting schools, et cetera, et cetera, which I think is what you're trying to say there, that, but often trustees are invited individually um, to go to schools and to have contact with staff. So um, that's interesting to have it written there. Additionally, I would just want to put some sort of caveat in there that when it's your child's school, it's all okay and that you shouldn't have to go through hoops, although I highly recommend that you are cautious. So you wouldn't be going to your child's school as a trustee though, would you? You would be, walk if you are a trustee and you walk into the school, you're a trustee. I don't care if you're still the parent, they still know you're a trustee. So just. Secretary Treasurer, do you have any um, suggestions for number 35-3? that would address Trustee Whitaker's concerns. I do not have any suggestions at this time. Hey, okay, Trustee Whitaker, do you have any suggestions for changes of wording? Mm, not at the moment, but I, I'm putting it out there that I do think that many of the trustees on this current board do not go through the superintendent to talk to staff. Um, so that being said, I get that that's a really nice idea, but I think that's going to be a lot of work in the future. So something to think about. I'll think about some way to edit that. It's, it's a nice thought, but it's not what we do. It's not what we're practicing right now. Okay. Um, any other concerns? Justy Duncan? Yeah, I had a, a similar, a slightly different concern about the same item. Um, so it says arrange personal contact with staff through the superintendent. So I'm wondering, you know, what staff really we're referring to. So Trustee Whitaker raised the issue of, of uh, as a trustee uh, going and visiting a school. Um, my understanding of our current policies and regs, trustees have the right and, and really the obligation to show an interest in what's going on at schools and to make arrangements through the principal. Uh, to make the principal aware of the purpose of the visit and to arrange a mutually agreeable time to, to undertake that visit. The fact that during this board's term, there seemed to be some cons concern or confusion about a trustee's right to go and visit a school um, is, you know, unfortunate, but, um, you know, it happened and, and it's behind us, hopefully. I'm wondering, and I, I thought as I read this point, that possibly the intention here is different. So, and, and again, I, I look to staff or to whoever put the, uh, the the policy together to kind of clarify what the intention was, but I assume that uh, this was intended to have trustees uh, who wanted information about a matter. Uh, so for instance, say I want to have more information about 
procurements, um, facilities procurement practices, um, that I would make that request for information through the superintendent who would take the necessary steps to either connect me with this right staff person or, or, or just collect the information and provide it to me. I'm guessing, so I, I think at the very least, the point needs to be clarified, but I also hope that it's not intending to have the superintendent acting as a conduit between trustees and, uh, and uh, schools. Do you have suggested wording? Well, I think first, um, uh, Sarah, I need to understand what the intention was. Um, well, and, and then I can go from there. Okay, Secretary Treasurer or Jordan, can you provide any help me out here? Uh, For me, it, it was, was district staff. Uh, okay, so district. Okay. I, I don't know what uh, it would be good to call on others, uh, interim yeah. superintendent or uh, trustee yeah. ward. So, Ms. Wetton? Mm, yes, I, I do believe the intent is that it's arranging personal contact with staff. Uh, so I don't believe it is in interacting on visits to schools or invitations that you may have to attend a school function. I think it is uh, the personal contact of that trustee who may seek further clarity or information regarding an item. So with district staff? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if we added the word district in there, that might, um, that might make it clearer. Trustee Duncan? Um, yeah, no, thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. I suppose what I would suggest is that, um, you know, uh, so I'm thinking of two things. One, um, I'm thinking, okay, so if I have, you know, did, by district staff, does that mean the secretary treasurer as well? Because, you know, um, I know that myself and colleagues where the secretary treasurer has responsibility for a particular area and, and I have a question and I, I need some assistance. Maybe I'm deciding I wanna bring forward a motion, um, but I need some background material or I'm not really clear on a particular point. I might go directly and I know some of my colleagues would go directly to the secretary treasurer as an example of technically I think district staff. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily go through the superintendent to do that. Um, now, if I was going to, uh, like I say, the example of um, our, our director of facilities, if I was going to uh, request some information from the director of facilities, I would um, likely go through the superintendent or do it in a board meeting um, through the chair. So I guess, you know, district staff might be too broad a term. Um, I think we have to think about what our actual practices are. And if we're seeking to change those practices, then I think we just need to be clear why and, and what the context is and then what the protocol is moving forward. Mr. Ferris. I think it's a good idea to reinforce the notion that our contact with district staff is through the superintendent of schools. I understand what uh, Trustee Duncan is is saying, and and I don't disagree with anything she says. But what I would say is that historically we've had examples of people who have overwhelmed staff with requests for information, and I and I'm not saying that's the case now. I'm just saying that it's something that's out there, and I think the superintendent has to have the ability to kind of rein that in if it's necessary. Uh, so, so I think it's a good idea because really, uh, really our, the person that reports to us is the superintendent and the person that we go through to find information is the superintendent. So uh, again, I don't disagree with what trustee Duncan is saying, I just think that if we're gonna have a policy, we need to give it some grit a little bit. Thank you. Trustee Painter. I just wanted to um, uh, echo what Trustee Ferris is saying. And I think the other rationale for doing that is ensuring information flow 
to the rest of the board. Uh, if the superintendent knows what's coming through, uh, the superintendent knows the kinds of requests that are being made and can ensure that those requests, um, any information, anything is being fed back to the board uh, so that we don't have a trustee um, in a meeting asking a senior staff member for a special meeting about something and that doesn't come back to the board. Uh, we always need to make sure that everything is coming to the board so we all have the same information and we can all act uh, from the same uh, the same space, the same point of, of, uh, of, of, of having that, that information. So I think it's important that we do act in a way that does consistently go through the superintendent. I mean, certainly when I started, that was the direction I was given to always go through the superintendent. Um, if I had any question or any comment or any concern or needed any information. Um, and so that is what, uh, that is what I've done in practice is, uh, always attempted. And if I've ever done wrong, I've been corrected. I've been directed back to the superintendent, which is appropriate. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that's, to me, that seems like the best way to ensure that we're all getting the same information that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. Thank you. So under, we're moving on, um, under arranged personal contact, we're going to add the word district in there. Uh, any other concerns under one through nine on that page? Trustee Duncan, a different point. Um, I just have a point of clarification, Chair, which I imagine will be quite quick. Um, I, so uh, does that mean that as a trustee, I shouldn't um, contact the secretary treasurer anymore? I should go through the superintendent? That's what this would say, yep. And so, um, so Secretary you know, if, Treasurer, do you have any concerns with that? Or the Superintendent, do you have any concerns with that? I think from my perspective, it's always helpful to include the Superintendent. So if it's an email, it's a Superintendent. I don't have a concern if, if the Secretary Treasurer is included in it. I think it's effective and efficient to uh, include the Superintendent in it. And so just a, a follow up then chair. So I, I think then if the intention here is to make sure that everybody has the same information and ensure some, um, you know, uh, that, that all trustees have the same information and the superintendent is gonna act in a, as a conduit. I, what I would like to see is that, um, that that's, that's stated at three. So arrange personal contact with staff through the superintendent and the superintendent will ensure that all trustees receive uh, this, the, the information resulting from that communication or something of that nature. But um, what I don't like, frankly, I'll be very frank, what I don't like is when I sense that there is unnecessary limitations, I absolutely be the first one to acknowledge how difficult it is for folks to balance uh, you know, a lot of information requests coming at them or indeed for the superintendent, uh, the, the need for the superintendent to be kept in the loop. But equally, uh, you know, I, I've seen that, that some trustees will, uh, through more informal relationship building kind of endeavors, have informal conversations with staff, pick up the phone. In fact, I remember as a new trustee being advised by a more senior trustee that I really, what I should do, instead of bringing up the issues in board meetings, I should pick up the phone and talk to the staff and, and, and ask the questions and have more informal um, interactions. So, you know, I, 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 I think we need to be consistent. We need to be realistic. And if the intention is to have the superintendent act as a conduit, even in, in respect of the secretary treasurer, uh, then I, I, I'd also like a commitment that the communication and the resulting information does come back to everybody and we just put it in the policy. Okay, um, we're moving We're moving on for number three, unless there's, well, unless there's wording change amendment. Well, it's not a wording change, but if I could just finish as well on this, my, my biggest concern with this particular clause is that it presents the opportunity for some trustees to be treated differently than others. Um, and that has been the practice where some trustees don't have to go through the superintendent and others do. So that is my concern with that particular line is that it is not enforceable for all, 
but it is enforceable on some. And so that's my concern there. Trustee Waters. Trustee Waters. Um, I just wanna say I'm a little uncomfortable about, it feels like we're sort of casting aspersions. I don't know which trustees are being accused of going outside of our processes, but uh, the main point in that policy is to make sure that everybody is on an even playing field and that we are all going through these same channels. So if the concern is, is that some folks have access that others don't, the policy is intending to change that. And I know that like over the years that I was chair, I spent a lot of time asking people to please go through the, the, the channels because we all need to use those because it really it limits a duplication of effort and ensures you know, real clarity. Um, and I would never call up any staff person um, without checking in with the superintendent. I wouldn't send an email to any other staff person without copying the superintendent. I mean, that's been our process. It's been written out in a variety of communications protocols that have been agreed to by this board. I feel like we've had this conversation um, a lot because it is really, really important that everybody is on equal footing because each member of the board is equal. Um, so to me, this is actually a really important point in that everything does go through the superintendent and it does need to be consistent um, and everybody needs to do it. That's absolutely the case. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're moving on from number three. So are there Chair, any other... Pardon me, is the public allowed to uh, uh, add their thoughts? Uh, not on number three. We've exhausted the conversation on number three. We're on number one, two, through till nine, 3.5 um, under roles and responsibilities, but we're not sure going to discuss. Was an amendment. And what was the amendment? So at three, uh, arrange personal contact with staff through the superintendent who will ensure that all trustees receive the resulting information. May I add that perhaps there could be some sort of a system whereby through the chair, the, uh, it's simply much like correspondence to the board, it, there can be correspondence to staff and that it is simply made public perhaps to the, the board on, on a, a weekly or, or monthly or what have you basis. Um, I'm, Esther, that, that is probably not what we're talking about, but I don't think that would work in the context of what we are we are talking about here. I understand what trustee um, uh, Duncan has put forward. So uh, this is an amendment. Arrange personal contact with district staff through the superintendent who will ensure that all trustees will receive all of the, will, can you re repeat the last part of it there, trustee Duncan? Yeah. That sure that all trustees will who will ensure that all trustees receive yep. resulting information. Receive, okay. Okay, uh, superintendent, do you have any issues with that addition? I think because I'm not clear of how often this will occur, it may be quite problematic to do that. I think if this is for the intention of seeking clarity and going through either copying the superintendent uh, and going through to staff with questions of clarity, that I, I see that as absolutely uh, imperative is that everyone gets the same information. So I don't have a concern, but if every communication or every question then is shared, I'm just not yet sure how that will unfold in the most efficient and effective way so okay that was fairly uh okay so we have an amendment uh proposed by trustee duncan so i'm going to call the question on the amendment all those in favor of the amendment raise your hand trustee duncan all those opposed to the amendment and that amendment fails Okay, so we're back to the main wording with the word district in front of staff. Okay, any other questions, questions on number one through nine, but not number three? We've exhausted number three. 
Any other concerns, questions? Can I do, was that nine? I'm sorry, I got my X's and I's mixed up. I do what have- what I number are you on? Nine. IX, is that nine? <laughs> IX is nine. So you want I'm number sorry, nine? I'm was, sorry, I was confused there. I just think that you need to strike the second report. It reads, after attending conferences, seminars, or workshops at, at board expenses, the trustee shall submit a report to the board, which report will be. So I think that second report needs to be struck. So it will which say will which be. will be included in the next okay. board agenda package. That's easy, easy peasy. I like easy peasy. Okay, okay. Sometimes. okay, that was up to number nine. Okay, any others up to number nine? Trustee Duncan. Yeah, so, and, and again, um, the majority of the board might not feel the need to, to, to clarify this, but at four, uh, it says, keep the board and district management informed in a timely manner of all matters coming to their attention that might affect the district. Um, again, there, I, for me, there's a missing piece in terms of an action. So, um, you know, how, 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 how should they keep, keep uh, district management um, and the board informed? So they should, you know, email folks, pick up the phone and tell the superintendent. Um, I just think we need to have some, some clarifying action instruction here. Um, so again, uh, there is some kind of protocol that can in fact meaningfully be applied to everyone, not in a piecemeal fashion or at the discretion of a few people um, that have you know, the position or the power and authority to, to exercise that discretion, but that everyone is truly treated in the same, in the same manner. Um, so I uh, don't know if we can add some wording it clarifies how to do so, how to inform, whether it's by email, in writing, like some, it could be very simple, like inform in writing, something like that. Chair, I may have a suggestion. Trustee Painter. I don't know if this is going to meet what Trustee Duncan is looking for, but perhaps um, you could say, keep the board and district management informed via the trustee's email in a timely manner, or if we want to put that in there, just the trustees email will loop in the board and district senior staff. Um, so that, that might mitigate the yeah. challenge. I think you're trying to. Um, just via email. It. Let's make it simple via email. Well, I'm, I'm, I was saying the trustees email, which is the trustees at SD 61 dot like that trustees list serve because that automatically loops in that whole group, but Maybe that's being too prescriptive, but that's was just my thought. Oh, if we can put that in. Chelsea Duncan, does that connect yeah. with your concern? Okay, Chelsea yeah, Waters. Like Chelsea Waters. I'm not going to stand in the way of this, but I just want to say this is a policy, which is supposed to be, you know, a pretty high level and not maybe yeah. getting down into the operational pieces right it's statements about what we believe and what we are committing to um so the how is not it not usually a part of policy the policy is operationalized through regulations and administrative procedures so i think it's fine if you want to be specific but just to just to be mindful that that's we are dealing with a policy at this point okay i don't think uh, i think we have enough consensus here, we'll add via trustee email in there um, just to move this along. Any other questions under number one through nine, not number three and four? Okay, returning the page. Number 10 through whatever that number, XIV, 15, 10 through 15, or whatever that is. As I always adhere to the trustee code of conduct is the last one. Any concerns or questions on that last page? Okay. Uh, no yes. Excellent. Oh, trustee Whitaker. Yeah, sorry. I don't really have concerns with what's written there. I just, and it, it's going to come up for me or it continues to come up with for me is that, you know, as much as we write all this down, there's no police, there's no compliance officer or anything for these. So you know, I guess I'm taking it a lot with a bit of a grain of sand or whatnot. <clears throat> you know, like, especially when I see 15, always adhere to the trustee code of conduct. So what if you don't? What's going to happen? 
right? Like I just, I just think that there needs to be, and I know that discussions are happening with the BCSTA to, to create you know, some of those supports for individual trustees when there are challenges on the board. So, I mean, maybe I'm speaking too quickly on that, but I do see that as, <clears throat> this is great. I would really like to see more conversations at the provincial level and on the board as to what happens and how we support each other when these things don't go the way we want. For example, yeah. just the, when, you know what, when new trustees start going to schools and visiting principals and principals don't know how to say, hey, look, man, I got other stuff to do, that there's a, an opportunity and a way for us to have conversations that are supportive, that bring us back together as team and don't penalize and ostracize individuals into thinking that they're, because they haven't done one of these things, right, that there is a a non-punitive way to bring people together and to move forward. And I guess when I read this and as I'm speaking to the language before is that that tone is not in these documents. It's very, um, you must do this or else. And the or else doesn't seem to be a positive. This is what will happen in a, to, to bring us back together. And if we keep doing things based on the black and white without the, you know what? We're, ed we're in education. Making mistakes is what we want our kids to do so that they can learn. And if we're not allowed to make any of these mistakes and learn without uh, creating great strife on the board, I think that we have other challenges. So just to put the comment out there that I think as we all think about this before the next board meeting, look at that language and see if there's ways to make that less of an attack. Okay, thank you. Um... We've got to the end of the document. So we're going to, uh, maybe the secretary treasurer or somebody could tell me, did somebody put this motion on the floor yet? Oh, Jordan did. Okay. We're gonna call the question and here's the amendments. So, so far, all I have is da, 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 under number three, we've added district staff. And number four, we've added via trustee's email. And number nine, we've taken out the second word, the word report of this last part of the sen sentence. And that was all I have. Okay, so call the question. All those in favor of this motion? Okay, opposed? Trustee Duncan's opposed and abstaining from Trustee Whitaker. Yeah, I'm going to um, wait to see those amendments in writing. Yeah, so um, we'll abstain there. Uh, I'd like somebody to move the role of the board as and table it till the September meeting. Trustee Painter, thank you very much. Because we just don't have time for that. But I really, really appreciate everybody's hard work so far tonight on what we've accomplished. That's, it is hard work. I tell you, I've got a headache. Okay. Um, Karen, we need to vote on the tabling. Sorry. Oh, sorry. All those in favor of tabling till the September ops meeting. Thank you very much. That's unanimous. Thanks, uh, Ryan. Um, E7, meeting format options. And who's that under? That is under finance and legal. Secretary Treasurer. Yeah, I think we're bringing uh, some information to the board tonight, recognizing uh, we're heading into a new year and uh, there is discussion around uh, in-person meetings or remote meetings. And I think uh, interim Deputy Superintendent Roberts has prepared a memo for us. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. I hope that the memo on pages uh, 54, I believe, and 55 uh, enable members of the board to have some uh, discussion around the relative merits of the various hybrid option meetings or an in-person meetings. So I, um, with the help of uh, Director Canty of IT, I hope that the table on the second page enables the board to uh, say discuss the, the merits of the various options before them. Okay, so there's no motion before us tonight. So 
was it a general discussion that you were looking for in feedback or generally? Yes, uh, I think there's no particular recommendation coming from staff. It's just to lay out what possibilities we believe to be possible for the next year, given the, the time and, and finances available. So yeah, no, no recommendation regarding which of the options. I think it's a, a matter for the board to discuss and decide uh, which of those they think would serve best. Okay, Ryan, then Trustee Duncan. I really want to thank uh, staff uh, Colin and uh, Director Canty for bringing this to us. I know certainly watching um, some of our colleagues uh, around uh, the province at at other boards uh, look at um, trying to bring in the technology to do this uh, has been has been an interesting experience. And I think when you have older buildings, uh, it, it definitely becomes more challenging. Um, I appreciate the the options presented, the advantages, the disadvantages. Um, you know, it's no surprise that what I'll want is the opportunity to bring in an option that provides the most flexibility, not just for trustees, but for people who are attending to ensure that people uh, who have childcare duties or um, who have work uh, conflicts or other challenges, or maybe who want to you know, who live in Gordon Head and want to participate uh, in the meeting and want to speak, but don't want to drive all the way for five minutes to speak to drive all the way home. I mean, I think there are absolutely ways I would love to see us um, bring in more technological capacity to how we engage and reach out to the community. But I also understand that that, that, that means money, that it costs money to do that. So, um, you know, there, there's no motion on the table, but you know, certainly going through the options for me, option four seems like an option that I think meets both needs, the needs of the board to meet in person, which I think is really important um, and stakeholders so that we can be in a room uh, together to, um, to do our governance work. Um, I miss being in a room with my colleagues and I miss being in a room with uh, with staff and stakeholders. Uh, I miss being able to be there to see everybody, to hear everybody, communicate together. That's something that I would love to be able to do. Um, and I think having the opportunity to do our standing committee meetings where stakeholders and, and the public can more openly engage and participate uh, is is absolutely uh, the, the route we can go because th those are the, you know, the meetings where there is more participation, there is more opportunity to engage. Um, and in the absence of the technological capacity to, uh, to do this, um, to me, that seems like the best next opportunity with, a great, um, with the least potential for technical challenges. So we're not putting an undue burden and undue stress on staff to try to meet uh meet meet those those needs so those are just my thoughts um for the conversation i would love to see eventually build out of of the it and tech capacity to do the full meal deal but at this point uh option four to me feels like a, a good compromise thank you chair Jesse duncan yeah thank you chair um and thank you to mr roberts and mr canty and, and the team for pulling this together um i appreciate uh all the time and effort that would have gone into creating the memo and setting out some options for us tonight. Um, from my perspective, uh, I, I'd like to see us um, determine the costs associated with, um, you know, if the future best case scenario, uh, I assume the board at some point will want to return to in-person meetings and to achieve that, um, if that is the end goal, um, I think requires some some costing of technological uh, or, or technical solutions to support that. Um, at this point, given the financial constraints that our district uh, finds itself in, um, and without any kind of estimates at this point, um, what I would suggest is that we uh, continue with uh, the Zoom meetings. Uh, so option two uh, in the new school year, uh, we give staff time to. Um, to come up with some, some costings so that we know what we're working toward. Um, I, I think one of the kind of, you know, happy benefits of, <laughs> if there can be happy benefits of a pandemic is um, 
is is the in person or is the 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 technological solutions that we've become accustomed to, and the increased uh, accessibility that that has afforded uh, many folks. Um, and I, I would hate to see us return to a pre-pandemic option, which was less than satisfactory when it comes to, you know, even something as simple as properly hearing who's speaking. Um, you know, with the current boardroom setup, it is difficult to even identify who, who is speaking um, and sometimes uh, to hear stakeholders if, for instance, they've called into the meeting. So, uh, yeah, that's my suggestion is that we continue status quo uh, via Zoom, acknowledge that that has actually increased accessibility for many of our um, stakeholders and rights holders, and uh, look to identify the costs associated with whatever the end goal will be in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Trustee Whitaker. Thanks. I don't have a really hard opinion on this, but I did want to share that I just recently did chair a hybrid meeting, which I was very nervous about doing at first, but you know, it was seamless. It worked really, really well. Uh, it is a matter of ensuring that, you know, your tech's working before you start. And I found other speakers to get them in uh, because everybody was still had their own laptops as well. It was it worked really well and it, it, it wasn't a problem. So um, that is a thought uh, for people. But the trick is, is um, people have to have some technology to be able to access so that you're not having to change who is is the speaker on the screen at the time. Uh, but I would also uh, echo trustee Duncan's comments that, you know, if there's anything I hear about the previous meetings that we used to have when people are talking about if we're going back is the fact that when we were filming in the boardroom, there was, it was really hard to hear or understand what anybody was saying. Um, so that kind of really took away a lot of the, you know, the engagement piece that I think we're hoping for. Um, you just you just could not decipher what people were saying. So until those upgrades are done, I, I am challenged to meet in person. Okay. Uh, Andy had a question from Mary. Was it possible to share the Zoom link without, I missed the end of the question. Um, I'm through the, okay, the question. Um, and then maybe Mari would like that. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see. Uh, just, actually, I was just, oh, is that okay? Yeah, ask your question. Yeah, just, I'm just wondering, like, if you can just share the Zoom link without, you know, me emailing or like, you know, I think, like, I think there was like a, is that more expensive if I don't, if you share the link publicly or? Um, Mr. Canty. Um, through the chair, the, the problem we have with publicly shared links is a security one uh, is one of the issues where they can become hijacked. And so uh, the uh, Zoom and other companies require you to, to share privately. Um, otherwise, they notify you um, if a link has been shared publicly. Um, it's considered a, a form of a, um, not a breach, but a, a, a security share. Great. Oh, I Thank see, you. I see. So then that's why you can't just say, oh, you can attend here and then just yeah. put the link. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the um, um, the memo and the, the information. I know that um, we will be discussing it and um, as we move forward and figuring out what we're going to do. Um, I'm sure trustees might even uh, want to bring it up or have a motion at some point in time um, to give staff direction on which way they would like to see. Right now, uh, a couple of trustees have expressed which options they like best. And so uh, we'll leave it at that for this evening. We're going to move on to, that's a, as it is getting late, facilities operations update. F1, Mr. Morris. Through the chair. I trust all of you have had a, a read of our report uh, as distributed in the packup. Are there any questions or comments uh, relating to that report? Trustees, any questions for that? Trustee Duncan? 
Yeah, thank you um, through the chair to Mr. Morris. Um, appreciate the updated report. I just had a couple of quick questions. Uh, one around building maintenance services. Um, wondering if you could update us on um, kind of where we sit uh, with, you know, work orders. And I know that the team was working very diligently and um, using some some innovative all hands on deck approaches to uh, making their way through work orders. And I'm just wondering um, how that's going. Uh, through the chair, the process is going well uh, as we have just initiated and Justin's still doing some training on the new eBase uh, work order system. And it's, it's, in, uh, it's collecting a bunch of other processes that we can initiate as well. Uh, so that's going fine. Um, we still sit at this point with uh, quite a few uh, backlogged work orders. Um, it's just because of what led up to this. And uh, uh, so as of uh, July, we'll have two new carpenters on the board, and that will really help um, the building maintenance services deal with a lot of other work that wouldn't necessarily be um, completed by this current staff because we're so short. We were so short staffed uh, prior to the hire coming up. If you need numbers, I can get you numbers for the next meeting. Thank you. Uh, no, that was great. I appreciate it. Um, and Chair, if I may, with, I just had one more other uh, question. Yep. Mr. Um, I just wanted to, so, thanks for that. Um, and no, I, I don't need numbers. Um, I, I, I trust that uh, the new system and, and the approaches taken are, are gonna help uh, you folks get through it and uh, wish you the best of luck. I know those kinds of things can be very challenging. Um, my other question was just around the aviation shop. So um, I appreciate the, the update in this uh, particular report um, reference, the, the plane hangar storage review and, and the cleanup that's in progress um, at Mount Doug. I, I just wanted to clarify um, that uh, those, that, that, that uh, review and, and cleanup, um, is that in preparation to receive students or have we already received students? Um, once again, I'll have to get to that information. I don't have it right at my fingertips, uh, trustee. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Morris. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Ryan. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thanks to Director Morris for, as all, always, I hope you don't get tired of hearing how great your reports are because they're, they're, they're great reading. Um, I had a couple quick questions. The BC uh, Hydro <laughs> Energy Manager funding increasing from 50% to 60%. Um, this is going to sound like a really dumb question, so my apologies, but through the chair to you, this is this is going to be a savings to us, uh, I'm assuming, um, which will help in for budget stuff, right? Because you know, we've had budget challenges. So um, it, I'm going on the assumption that that's a savings to us. When does that start? Um, is, has that started already or does that start in the new year? What What's the timeline for that? Uh, the information uh, through the chair, the information I have uh, direct from the energy manager who submits information for these reports, um, funding has been increased. So it, it's reading that it's already taken place. Okay, that's that's great news. Um, oh, Kim, sorry, I'll stop. I'll wait. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll just add to that. You know, uh, in our annual budget, we uh, budget for the hydro contribution to the energy manager's uh, salary and benefits. Uh, and if that changes slightly from year to year, uh, we would include that in our amended budget that we report out in February. Wonderful, thank you. And Chair, one more final question, if yep. I may. Yes. Um, I, I was reading with uh, quite a bit of um, appreciation the transportation part of your report uh, and going through that and seeing the uh, efforts to gain service uh, to Songhees Nation uh, was really encouraging. Can you give us a little bit more background uh, on that through the chair on on um, hoping to gain the route on the inception of that and you know how that's looking don't need to you know we don't need too much but I'm just, I just it was really interesting to see that and uh, and there's there's hope there to, to be you know doing some transportation work with it with the nation uh, that's our hope as well I know uh, my manager uh, Eric has been doing a lot of work towards this and uh, we're all looking for a successful completion on it and once again, um, uh, trustee, 
I can get more information for you if you want to be more up to date at our next session. Sure. I mean, again, it was just really uh, not not super necessary, Director, uh, through to the chair to you. It's just really encouraging to see that work being done. Um, and then, of course, all the field trips. Uh, that looks really exciting, too. Thank you. That, that's awesome. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for the detailed report again. Wonderful, as always. <laughs> uh, we will move on to the Kai Seismic Project update. And... Who's taken that one? Oh, Marnie. Hi there. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, so a little bit of an update. Um, the shoring will start to be removed this week, which is great news. The electrical mechanical is progressing well, and we're starting to get some walls up. Um, the windows, uh, the window replacement and the repointing in the terracotta are progressing. There is some lead paint concerns within the building now that we're working with an abatement company to, to determine if we're going to encapsulate or we're going to remove. And there is mold found in one of the rooms, so we're in the midst of removing and remediating that mold as well. We are starting to order furniture, which is exciting, so we're working on ordering the science desks for the science rooms. Um, we're gathering all the info for the um, tender package number nine, which is all the site work in the turf field. So we're planning on... Um, awarding that this week and we're still on schedule to have all the students and staff in the building in September 2023 so it's progressing within schedule. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Trustee Whitaker. Uh, I just <clears throat> just feel like uh, it would be prudent to just put forward the question about the sewers and the garden that was at our beginning of our meeting um, and I don't expect you to answer now, but, you know, just the heads up as to within your planning and scheduling, if that is something that can shift or if that's a city thing and if we can get that back to us for the board meeting. Yeah, I'll definitely, there'll be a memo that comes out to you guys for the board meeting to answer. I broke down all your guys' questions. You're Great. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Duncan. Yeah, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you so much, Marnie. I look forward to that memo. Um, and thanks for bearing with, with us through a long meeting. I know yeah. you end up being the very last on the agenda. <laughs> um, I just had a couple of quick questions. Um, one around the, the scope uh, of the update. So I, I'm drawn back to this number of 825 to 1,000 students. Um, so the, the so the capacity from eight, if we were to range from 825 and go to 1000, uh, that's 175 seat increase. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, my understanding was that we were, we were gonna have a 200 seat uh, capacity increase. Um, so I just wondered if um, I've got that wrong or if um, there's any background or context that you could provide. Uh, Marnie, are you able to answer that one? No, I just have to re read the board report because it went from a capacity to 825 to 1,000 students. And I'd have to go back to the ministry and look at the reasons why. I don't have it at the top of my head. I'll get that to you for next week, for next month. Thank, okay. Thanks, Mark. So just to clarify through the chair, if I may. Um, so yep. that, the numbers are right. We're just not sure why there's a decrease in, in, in capacity. I don't know if there's a decrease in capacity. There's definitely an increase in capacity for the project. Um, but I see, I, I do understand your question. I just don't know how to answer it at this point. Yeah, fair enough. Thanks. Um, I, my only other question, Chair, um, yep. is just around the, the contingency. So I know we're, we're looking at to mitigate risks. Uh, we, we know that our construction managers forecasting budget uh, overages. Um, and I know uh, Marnie kindly reported last month that uh, the ministry did uh, approve, um, I believe it was in February, uh, an $8.2 million um, uh, risk reserve, I think it's called, funding uh, increase. Uh, and I'm just wondering if there's further update regarding risk and funding, whether we think that uh, we will in fact have enough risk reserve in place to address those um, escalating costs, uh, or if there's an, a new update around that. Marnie? Um, right now, we are within the budget. So we do have $2.6 million below the line that we can still ask the ministry to fund and we have to have reasons um, for approval to get that money. Um, so we are working on um, requesting that money. 
and that's worked within our budget. So when we get that, we are within budget for the project right now. Great, thank you. Uh, Esther, you had a question? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, through the chair, I have some questions uh, for Mr. Morris. I looked at the response to some of the letters uh, that were forwarded regarding the parking for the daycare. And I noticed in the response that it didn't actually, it, it talked, it gave a lot of detail about how parking is being moved from current sites uh, to other sites uh, on the Vic High grounds. But didn't, it didn't clearly address the question about parking for the NLC, for the daycare specifically. And I noted that five parking spots, uh, there is a plan to put five parking stalls uh, in the area, the northernmost demolished bleachers. Uh, but I do recall that uh, I believe in November, I think actually January, it was stated that the, so that's one day lay down area, but it was stated that the lay down area to the north of the school would also be used for parking. And there has been no clarification around that. So I'm wondering if there are two lay down areas at least, but in reference to new parking at the north of the school, there's the lay down area of the demolished bleachers, but there's also the lay down area of what was green space. And so is there a plan to put spark park, because there's a plan to put four parking stalls. That's what the notice said, but the five at the site of the uh, demolished bleachers doesn't fit that description. So on the site of the NLC, because the, again, very specifically the notice references the site of Vic High, doesn't reference the site of the NLC. So is there a plan to put parking in what was green space at the north end of Vic High, please? So um, I'm not sure if you're able to answer that tonight, Mr. Morris, or if you have to get back to us, but uh, I'll leave it to you for a second to see um, what you're able to answer. Yep, thank you. Um, I don't have all of that in front of me right now. I can get it in, uh, and have it to present it at our next operations meeting. And when is the next operations meeting, please? Uh, in September. Right. So I, I do have to comment, though. Uh, a survey was sent out to parents and the community. And this question this information was not included after a statement had been made during a meeting that there was an intent to use green space at the north end of Vic High for parking. That information was missing. I drew attention to that. That information was not supplied. And this happened in March. I believe the survey shut down on March 11th. And so we're now in June. And I'm asking the same question and I'm being asked to wait until September. And I'm wondering if you believe that this is reasonable. Uh, did you have uh, another uh, question? Let me, sure, I'll, go ahead, I'll Mr. Quickly, I'll quickly respond. As with any large project such as this major project, things change on the job site from day to day and week to week. So I cannot give you a, a concrete answer on, on why things might be different until I speak to the project manager so we can include that in our next report. Did you have another question, Esther, on another topic? Has it not or gone out to tender? I beg your pardon? I have. Has she it she not wants... gone out to tender? The Esther, NLC, you... the, the, the daycare, has it not gone out to tender? No, I can answer that. No, it has not. We haven't even got the building permit for it yet. Ah, okay. Hey, well, Esther, I look forward do you have another... to having really clear information in September. Okay, do you have another I question? I have um, another question. I did ask about lights and I, I was told that there would be lights. I, I noted that on the plans, there was no room for lights. I'm wondering if by lights, the district means lights for parking rather than the field 
it, so I'm asking for clarification around that. Are you asking for like uh, light standards in the parking area as opposed to the field area? Is that your I'm question? Wondering, yes, please. I'm asking through the chair for clarification about what what is meant by lights. I'll, I'll respond, Chair. Sure. Thank you. Um, wherever there's parking, we have to provide lighting. If you're referencing the field, uh, there's still a, a series of things we're debating over and um, making sure that all partners involved uh, are aware of what uh, some of the asks are and, and when we can do them. So that's still in the future. That's We're busy concentrating on the main building. We don't want to take uh, anything out of the classrooms. So okay. uh, it, we, we can show you the drawing, but okay. that would be ne next uh, meeting as well. I would have to add that the public are also partners. The public was asked to make donations and the public has made donations upward of $160,000. So I, the public has been consistently excluded from um, discussions or um, proposed modifications. And I'm wondering why the public continues to be excluded from these discussions. I have been told that the, th this project has gone out to tender. Um, we, you confirmed that there would be lights. And I said, well, I don't see anyone on the plans. And I believe that was last month. Um, but you said it had gone out to tender and that there would be lights. But at this meeting, it sounds like that is now unsure. As I mentioned, there is constant change in large projects like this. Everything will be uh, brought forth as we take our next steps. But I can't talk about that right now because there's still a number of other things we have to talk to with our partner groups. But clearly the district doesn't Esther, the public. Esther, pardon me. Pardon we're me. We're going to Thank move you. on from we're going to no, move on. Pardon from me. Life. Clearly the district doesn't view the public as a partner, even though it, the district requested donations from the public. And I see that this is inappropriate. I'm wondering so, if there's an intent to use the two lanes of the track for the lighting for the field, because I can't see how else they will fit. Is that the intent, please? Uh, All I will suggest is uh, wait. There's so much of this that we can't um, talk about right now because there's certain processes taking place. Did you see the uh, picture on page 64 of the packup, Esther, to do with the lights? Have you, re have you referenced the package, page 64? There is a whole page of lighting there. So I'll just page refer you to that. I believe, yes, I am looking at it. Okay. And I see parking, I see lighting for parking. Uh, did you have any other questions? But it was suggested last month that there was parking for the field, or pardon me, lighting for the field. And I can't see how that's physically possible unless the two lane track is used for it. And I believe the public deserves to know if that is and the it, case. And it was stated that we're not to that point yet. So we can't, we can't comment on that because we're not there yet. We're concentrating on the building. Even that though it's gone the, out to tender. Answer, that was the answer. Yeah, I was told last month that this had gone out to tender. Do you have and any that there other would be questions? lights included? And I'm asking how that is possible. And please recall that you are using $160,000 of donated money from the public. Do you so have I, any I, other I don't understand why the public is being. Point included. of order. Um, this The committee is for having a discussion, it's not for having. Um, you know, a confrontation with staff. I think everybody's done their very best to answer your questions. I beg your pardon, Trustee discussion. Waters. Thank you very much. This is not a confrontation. This is a discussion. This and is not I a discussion. Am Esther, this is not a on discussion. On behalf of members of the public, including myself, who made donations and who have been excluded from uh, discussions about modifications. It may not be to your liking, uh, Trustee Waters, that I'm asking these questions. It may be offensive to you in whatever way. However, I have the right to ask the questions. But just to and be really yes, clear, sir. the district did not solicit donations. I can show you 
on Vikai's website where the public was asked to make donations? We did not ask, to, ask them to make the okay. donations. Okay. Esther, do you have any other questions this evening? Mari does. I do have a question. I said that regarding, and through the chair of this, this is a question for uh, Ms. Morris. I asked about evidence of the claim that the district was required to make a $4.6 million contribution. So that has been asked and answered. It has not, not been answered. Again. Thank you. It has not been answered. It never it was answered. I was repeatedly interrupted by you. And yep. I finally said in frustration that I would ask the ministry and I did. Great. So I asked Mr. Francois Bertrand if he had any evidence of that claim. And he, he uh, gave it to me to ask again. He said, you, you must ask the uh, district staff directly. It's their okay. responsibility. And do, do you have any, we have asked and answered that. No, you so, have not answered it. It has never been answered whether or not there's been. actually evidence of that claim. Do you have any other questions this evening? I, through the chair, I'm asking Ms. Morris if she has any evidence of that claim. And the question was answered? It was not answered. It was not answered to your satisfaction, but it has been answered. Do you have any other questions this evening? Ms. Morris actually said that she would look into it. And so it was not answered. Do you I'm have asking, any other questions this she evening? She committed to looking into it. I'm asking if she found evidence of that claim. And I'm asking if you have any other questions this evening. And what does Ms. Morris have to say? I'm to not asking Ms. Morris, I'm talking to you. Do you have any other questions this evening? Are you, uh, <laughs> are you blocking my ability to ask staff questions? No, you've asked, you've asked the question. and It, it has, has not been, been answered. Ms. It Lord. has been answered. Mari, do you not have a question? Mari, do you have a question this evening? I have another question, thank you. I'm wondering how it is that the, that the district, having told the alumni that funding was not available, even though they qualified for the 4.6 million in NLC funding, it follows that if there's no funding through the, any means for something that has been in the books since 2007, the public had made donations towards and the board had supported and on the day of funding announcements, uh, uh, the uh, former Minister of Education said that they were looking forward to revitalizing Vikai's um, stadium. And I hardly call a reduction in everything a revitalization. So there, the, the public was led to believe, and there was an expectation that funding would come through uh, the ministry in, in concert with Vikai's seismic upgrade. So it follows that if, as the, the district has claimed and the board has claimed repeatedly that there was no funding for the Memorial Stadium revitalization project, that there was also no funding for projects that were never disclosed to the public, that were not included in the motion in June, 2018. The daycare was included in the motion and of course, there was an, an enormous amount of lead up towards the Memorial Stadium. So if there was no funding available for the Memorial Stadium, how is it that the district was able to turn around and suddenly find upwards of $3 million for another project through that the source of the funding ministry, that the, the Memorial ministry, Stadium qualified for? The ministry does not qualify, does not give funding for items such as the outside stadium area. They do give funding for NLCs. They don't give funding for the outside stadium area. They, I've looked at the emails. Uh, they had no qualms about giving using NLC funding. The NLC funding can fund all kinds of projects. And they had no qualms about funding, uh, giving the 700,000 for the NLC. They did actually have questions about using NLC funding for the, um, the, the, uh, the DAC. Why? Because it's actually technically an extension of a classroom. It is not an NLC project at all. And yet the district used NLC funding for that. And, he, and, and the emails show that they had to go get special permission. So again, it, the, the project that had gone through enormous public consultation, which was the Memorial Stadium Revitalization Project, had approval from the board, had uh, enormous public support, 
And, and even in the uh, seismic upgrade uh, questionnaire, the public said repeatedly, it rose to the top. Amenities for the school rose to the top above so, so Esther, the desire to save heritage. Esther, and yeah, we can't, they were told we can't, that there wasn't enough funding. We can't go back and reverse what has gone forward and is underway. So I'm can't, asking. We can't, we can't go back and change. Oh, yes, we can. No, we can't. So oh, do, yes, you have any, can. do you have any other questions? I'm asking the district, I'm asking the board to justify to the public why it is that the alumni were told there was no funding available to them. And then under that assumption and understanding, they wrote a letter in agreement to the proposed modifications to their project, after which emails and documents show the district suddenly came up with up to $3 million through NLC funding and turned around and used it for another project that was developed in utter secrecy. So Can I the district explain that to the public, please? I appreciate your passion. Does anyone else have any questions about the Vic High project this evening? Trustee Duncan. Oh, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I just I just note that um, Ms. Kello has asked um, what, what you've said is the same question uh, at multiple meetings. And I'm just wondering if we can just direct her to the answer to the question, um, just so that we can move on from it. I, you know, I think if the question has been answered, I think, you know, I just suggest that we say, okay, we answered the question, here it is, or, or you can find it there, whatever the case is. It's in the, it's in the documentation under the facts. Uh, when there was 25 questions that was asked, it's in that section of questions under the FAQ documents that were posted under the Vikai site. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Part of me is suggesting that the for the record documents answer my questions. Yeah. I'm here to say that they don't, but thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm looking for, oh, Mari, we're back to you. Okay, a quick question before we leave. Yeah, not really a question. Actually, I really just want to say I appreciate these questions that um, Esther Callow asked because I don't know a lot. And actually, these are the times that I find these things out. So I really appreciate them. Like, you know, I, I would actually like to hear the questions and the answers if possible. But like, I, I don't know where to go to find these answers. So actually, I would prefer to hear like this. I feel like this is the whole point of this kind of uh, committee, like standing committee, right? Like to hear from each other. So I, I actually kind of find it uh, annoying to not be able to actually hear the answers. So that's and my I, and comment. I, and, and I understand a lot of the a lot of the issues are going back multiple years of what she's asking. And so that's where the FAQ documents have been posted with asked and answered questions. So our staff has heard all of her concerns, all of her questions. And if they can bring back more information in the next document, they will. So I appreciate you uh, you mentioning that. So could I have a motion to adjourn? Trustee Duncan, thank you. All those in favor? No, sorry, sorry, Chair. No, I have a notice of motion before we adjourn under I. We, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yours was not accepted as new business tonight. I, I know that. Under I, notice of motion. Oh, so notice not of motion, sorry. Yeah. So under I, notice of motion, um, the, the, the Board of uh, Education of School District number 61, Greater Victoria, direct the superintendent to schedule the planned storm drain installation at Vic High for a period after mid-September 2022 to allow the Vic High learning farm growing season, including planting and harvesting to conclude without interruption and to provide support for the temporary move and preservation of the indigenous plant garden and Gary Oak Meadow. Thank you. Okay, motion to adjourn. Trustee Painter, all those in favor?